You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. There was a certain day when I first started doing a bit of uh, buying and selling for people. You know, I was turning over a million pound a day sometimes just buying drugs for people. Once they knew that I was there and I, they could drop money off with me and, and order things and the stuff would appear, you know, sometimes it was a good million a day just going through your hands and then it just gets moved on to people from all over the all over Europe, really. When the chase first started, there was a police motorbike coming behind us and we'd gone round a big bend because I'm in a big car, I was able to stop pretty quick. But he wasn't and he hit the back of the car and he flew over the top of the car. So the call went out, officer down, IRA suspects. That was the call. So then they just went fucking crazy, just shooting at everything. We reached that level where I thought I could come out. Did you ever have a target in your mind that make a few million then I'll quit? <coughs> yeah, I, I had like a 10 million market uh, level in my mind, thinking that's what I'd need to keep, because I was on the run, to, to stay out and stay out safely. Once, uh, we, within a, a couple of months of being involved with, with some of the, the Colombians, uh, a couple of them that I knew pretty well, would think nothing of dropping a thousand kilo off and just coming back a couple of weeks later. For, for the money. So when did you start making waves? When did you start becoming target, like, public enemy number one? When, when I met Curtis, really, it was after that. Boom, we're on. What's today's, yeah, today's guest is Steve and me. How are you, Steve? Nice. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Thanks for taking the time to come here. Yep. Very interesting story. A little, little bit. The, yeah, dubbed one of the biggest drug lords in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, you've been all over Colombia, South America. Yeah. You've done life sentences, 22 years, seven and a half years in was it Amsterdam. Yeah, seven years. Um, you've been about, very well connected, very well respected. Mm. First and foremost, how are you? Good, good. Life's getting better. Yeah. Day by day after coming out of prison. It's been 10 years now, so it's I'm settled in now. Yeah, it's a long time to be I out. think it takes about 10 years to settle in <laughs> after doing 16 and a half. <laughs> Is that you just starting to feel a free man? Yeah, sort of, yeah. Becoming. After the art exhibition, it becomes... Makes it feel like you've got a bit more purpose to life. Yeah. And you've got something to do. I always go back to the start of my guest. Where you yeah. grew up and how it all began. Yeah, I grew up in a little place called Newton East in Manchester. Quite a poor, well, a very poor area. Uh, came from a big family, there's nine of us as kids. Two died when we was early and then there was several of us plus parents, my mum and dad. But we always struggled. Mum always had health problems with Parkinson's and she used to mix it up with alcohol and stuff like that and it became a bit of a crazy family. But we're still a family and we still came through it. How did that affect you as a kid? Did that affect you straight away? Did you become angry towards Yeah, well, it, it affected me in a criminal way because what my mum used to do is she used to give us a, a list for a fiver and uh, give us two quid to go and get it. And if we didn't come back without it, we got a good hiding. So that started the shoplifting at the very early age of nine, even a bit less actually, but we'll say around nine. Nine's young enough to go shoplifting. So you had to go survival mode for a very young age to try and yeah. provide for the family? Well, yeah, in a way, a little bit, because yeah, I had my younger brother and sister with me, and we, three of us used to go and we used to walk out with full trolleys full of food. It was easier than paying the two quid that we had or the fiver that we had for the tenors of the food, so yeah, just ended up doing that. It just became natural. It didn't become anything that we even thought about. We just did it, and nobody ever looked at you anyway as a kid, so we didn't know the difference, but we, we just did it. It was easier back then, no cameras and stuff. No cameras, no nothing. Yeah. The good it, days. It's a choice, isn't it? You, get, you either get a slap off your mum or you, you, you do a bit of that and yeah. get a slap off the police. So either way, we was going to get a slap as a kid. So we, we just stole. What about dad? <clears throat> dad was an electrician, worked for the for Francis for years and thing. He, he just worked and worked and worked. And then my mum just created havoc everywhere with the... Uh, it was not one of her fault. And I only understand now at a later life that she was on uh, quite heavy medication and drinking 
you know, proper prescription medication for the Parkinson's and then drinking on top of it. We could find her anywhere between the Catholic club and our house, about half a mile away. She could be anywhere in somebody's garden, in the phone box, asleep or anywhere. So we had an hard <coughs> thing here. And we used to go shopping and do the, do the shoplifting and come Monday, we was out selling what we stole to the neighbour so my mum could go out drinking again. You know, that was, uh, that was my young life. But we still had a good life though. You know, I won't say I suffered. I didn't feel like I suffered. It's only when you look back now that you, <coughs> that you notice the suffering, but didn't feel like it at the time. Yeah, you realise that childhood trauma can have a major, a major yeah. effect for when you get Later older. Later on, yeah, in life, yeah. yeah. But... Uh, yeah, it was a it was a bit of a hard thing. So then I went on to stealing cars by the age of eleven, twelve. I was stealing cars by the age of twelve. I'd been caught by the police for stealing thirteen cars. So I fell asleep in one of them, and they woke us up. <laughs> How old? Twelve. Thirteen when I, when I got caught. Thirteen, and they give us uh, three months DC at the end of it. But uh, yeah, we felt I'd been out all day. We'd been into into Moss Side, stole a car from Moss Side, and drove about up to a place in, in in Oldham up on the moors and got lost. Ran out of petrol in the middle of the moors, and then a policeman had to bring us back to a certain place at three o'clock in the morning. I was thirteen years old. I think he would have just arrested us and took us back. Dropped us off on top of Old Moss, and then we had to climb down, get down for miles. And I ended up stealing another car to get home, which is the one I fell asleep in, which was the Lord Mayor of Oldham's car, unknown to me at the time. And they found us asleep in the car and just woke up to the knock on the window. And they didn't even bother bringing a car to take us down. They just kicked us all the way down the hill, the police. And then when my dad got there, he kicked us all the way home and then my mum kicked us all the way to bed. So, yeah, it was a thing. And then I got three-month DC, which was quite when it, the first short, sharp shot came out. Yeah, military stuff. Yeah, uh, Foster and all it was. And then we just got battered every day through that as well. They didn't hold back in them places. Any little thing, they just used to beat you up. But, uh, yeah, so that was the early days. Stealing cars, and they came out and went back to school. They tried to stop us going back into school, so I struggled then after that. I couldn't get back into school for nearly a year because of the prison sentence, like one of the first ones to get one. Even though it was only DC, it was still a sentence to them. And they, uh, they kept us out of school, and by the time I got back in school, it was too late, I came out of school with nothing, no qualifications. But I got a job at, at an advertising agency for graphic design and art, and then did about two years sign writing at uh, Oldham College, you know, day release, them days. Got a bit of a trade behind me, and then just went back into crime again. How was that going into the, the art kind of stuff? Did you see yourself having a future with that or was it just to pass the time? No, I, I did early days because I, I left and, and went to work for a few years as a graphic artist. Uh, but then crime got in, a, in the way a little bit again, started thinking I was clever again, going back to stealing cars. When I, I could have done really well at graphic art. It was an up-and-coming thing at the time. As, and it's that thing when you're a criminal... You tend to bounce from one thing to another rather than settle into something. And uh, I, don't, I don't know why that is, but I think that's what most of us do. We, we get a little bit of straight business in between and then as soon as that fails, we jump back into crime again. It's easier so It's the easier way out, yeah, mm -hmm. instead of fighting through it. But, uh, yeah, I left there and then I ended up getting a bike shop and same again. Somebody else committed a crime that I got dragged into. Ended up getting some prison time and lost the, the shot that I was going to get and again crime took over but I managed to get it back again had a bike shop for a few years then that fate sort of went down and I went back into crime and never came out of it then <laughs> yeah. easier option eh? are yeah. you saying that's not the easier option especially no, when you're doing fucking option, life no. sentences and hiding no. from every international police force on the, on the planet no and it's not <laughs> a thing what were you like in prison Stephen in prison yeah what was I like yeah uh my, my, were you my, business minded in there or were you just trying to survive? No, I, was, uh, I didn't do any business in there at all. I just went to education and to the gym. Uh, but with, with the thought that while I was doing the education, I, I'd be getting my qualifications. And that's what I did. I studied hard in there and, and got my degree with, with honours. That took us nine years. But 
from day one, I, like I say, when when I first got arrested and they put me in the police cells, the, when you know you phone, you get a chance to phone somebody up, the first thing I asked for was a pad and paper to start drawing, which is one of the the drawings we used to build the cell for the the art exhibition we just done. Now was from the first couple of days of being in the police cells in Manchester because it was just after when the after the Strangeways riots, so they, they'd let a few people into the prison, but somehow they didn't get it right. So they moved them, quite a lot of prisoners back out again to the cells. So I did about five months in police cells before uh, the sentence started and then they moved us back to Strangeways eventually. Because I was still on the run, from absconding from Kirkham from a previous sentence from 87. Did you run away? Absconded. Walked away very slowly <laughs> in, the back, in the back of a car. What was that, an open prison? Yeah, an open prison. Kirkham open prison. How long did you have left of that sentence? Just five months. I, I didn't go out. I went out to, to see a girl and, you know, the usual things. And then the alarm had gone off while I was out. And my, my reasoning was, well, there's no point going back now because I'm nicked anyway. So I might as well have a bit of time out. And that bit of time led to uh, floating off to Holland and not coming back at all. Did you get any time added on? No, just the five months. Just had to finish the five months, yeah. Sorry, right, innit? Yeah. Better pussy two minutes and then... Well, it did... Well, <laughs> well it, it did an extra I'd, five months. Had they caught me, <laughs> then I would have got some time added on. But when, when I come back and it was all already dealt with, it was uh, it was pointless, really, because I'd just done the 16 years and something else. See, when you were in prison, yeah. do you feel as if you were more creative then with your art and stuff and, and more... Did you feel as if you learnt more in prison? <laughs> Yeah, well, for some reason. Yeah, you 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 you've got to do certain things, so you push to do it every day. When you you're outside, it's, you, there's a thousand things that you need to do. Whereas in there, you get up in the morning, you go to class. You can't go anywhere else. You can't. Well, you can be sick for a bit, but you can't keep that up for long either. You have to go once you once you committed to the education. You have to go every day. So yeah, you you you're not forced to do it because you can work, but. Yeah, you definitely put under a nice strict regime that forces you to do it. But I'm quite strict with myself anyway when I'm out. I do a lot of work. I don't sit about doing things. I don't drink. I don't go any clubs and pubs and bars. I paint pictures. Yeah. That's my main occupation. So did you did you start doing graft in the UK before you went to Amsterdam? Uh, a little bit, yeah. yeah. My, my first smuggle was a disaster, really. I can't even call it. Just a comedy of errors really That's in the early 80s a couple of us went over to Amsterdam to buy uh, a kilo of cannabis didn't even know much about it but uh, we nearly got shot a few times in, through the coffee shop owners just walking in and asking for a kilo because it's still illegal to do that there even though people think Amsterdam's legal it's only decriminalised a little bit they're only allowed a certain amount so when people come in asking for kilos like they're undercover coppers or something like uh, we finally got one and got it back, but it was just a disaster. We all bought the, the train ticket. I put the money up, and I had two other people who were supposed to be doing it, but I might as well have just done it myself because I was with them all the time, bought the tickets together, came back on the train and the boat together. So it was uh, one of the best, but we learned from it. What age were you then? Uh, two, 87. You know, you work out, I'm 63 now. It's about 30, <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, so 20s in your yeah, 20s. Late 20s. So yeah. what gave you, what was the idea behind it? To, were you thinking to go international? Were you thinking I can get it cheaper there, make a couple of grand? What was your Yeah, no, thing? I just started that. I just, I, w I was happy to get a few grand to, to be able to go and do my first one. And that turned out to be quite easy. Apart from the trouble we had in, in Amsterdam. But even, even coming back on the boat, we fell asleep on the boat. And it was the police who got us off the boat. And the bloke had, had a kilo, a big slab of uh, ash on on with him, and he couldn't even climb over the barrier. Bar barrier. Police had to help him over. You know that was our first thing, and then we seen that. Well, if you if you stay on the boat a bit later, nobody's going to look at you. There's nobody there. They've all gone home. So we started doing that a bit as well. We got away with that for a bit, until they realised, and then they started putting people on sweeping the boats. Well, yeah, that was our first one, but it, there was no intention. They didn't have any plan or anything. It was just that was it. And then we sold it within a few days, and then we went back, and it was two, and then it went back. It was a, a briefcase full, and then it went back, and then it was 
bits and bits more all the time. Fuck's sake, you'll have your sleep, Stephen, man. I wouldn't have liked to bring a robbery with you. <laughs> no, <laughs> See, when you, were, you bought the, the first kilo, how much did you pay? A grand? For no, 500? 1,300 quid it was, actually, at the That's time. That's quite expensive, yeah. though. For, why was it so expensive? It, it was good quality. We didn't know that much at the time, but it was about an inch thick, just one slam. And the, the grade of it was, it just sent everybody, everybody got stoned off it properly. And they was queuing up you know, for more, just wanted more. It was just good quality. And uh, it was the Hells Angels we ended up getting it off at the time. So I was lucky there as well that they didn't set the money off us and kick us out, really, because it was proper green. We didn't know anything, did we? We know where we was going. Uh, yeah, so we, we, we broke our own little market at the beginning. And that just led to me moving to Amsterdam, really, then. Did you see the profit that you could have made by yeah. moving abroad and, and going for it? Going, yeah, but I ended up making more profit selling to people in Holland than thingy because I I, I, le I left uh, things about 80, 88 or something like that when I went to Holland. I don't really care. I, I came back for my mum's funeral, really. That was it. And even that I got grassed up for, so I didn't really bother after that. By who? Uh, this fashion designer who sent a lot of money to to build up a, a business in Manchester and he... Uh, I, I sent him quite a lot of money, and the next thing he heard that he was, he was actually buying my products with the money that I sent him to build up a, a, a clothing industry business, and uh, he was just snorting it up his nose. So that didn't go very far. But my, my, my mum's funeral, even on my mum's funeral, on the on the day, on the morning of the funeral, the coffin was there, and then the police came and banged on the door and said, because I was on the run from Kirkham at the time. And they came and my girlfriend had to hang out the window saying, no, there's nobody here, go away, there's a funeral downstairs. And fair play to them, they did go away and just left us. Just ended up going out of the back of the house and nobody was there. They left us to it, but that, that led then to going back to Holland again, being on my toes again, and it just led to the, the big sentences. Is that because they wanted you for the five months that you fucked off for? Yeah, that's all that was, yeah. Just thinking, if we, if we would have handed myself in there and then, might have been a message from my mum, eh? Yeah. If I would have handed myself in there and then none of this could have happened or would have happened, you know, that story of turn left or turn right, mate, and your old world changes, that could have happened, that could have been the point. Hindsight's a wonderful yeah, thing, though, mate. Isn't it? I'm, I'm brilliant at it, mate, yeah. especially now. Yeah, it's a fucking great thing, mate. Yeah. It's a, but again, it's led you to who you are and, like I say, the, the stories that you have and the life-changing things that you're doing, which we'll touch on later in the interview. But yeah. So when you started making waves in Amsterdam, you're not just thinking, get the five months out of the way, then I've not hiding all the time. Or did you, as a part of you kind of enjoyed like, getting chased, Stephen? No, no. What it is with me, I just couldn't go to a prison and knock on the door. You know, it's not in me to do that. Give yourself up like that. It's just something. Should have done it, stupid really. Now, look, again, that hindsight looking back. But I could never see myself walking up to a, a police station and saying, here, here I am, sort of thing. It's not my job, that is it? That's mm -hmm. their job. That. So you decided just to go on the toes in Amsterdam, build that on it? Yeah. But again, it, it, even that end, ends up in, in all sorts of madness because when, when I was in Holland, we, we started going about not dealing in, in drugs so much, but we used to go out what, sneaking. You know, going into supermarkets and stealing the takings it was different for us. We we went there and thought it's just an open area. This everywhere is open. The money's lying on the table, and the supermarkets and the money was just there, and the keys was in the safe in the middle of the supermarket. You just had to distract people, and you got big bags of money for nothing. It was uh, it was a good thing, but it led to a terrible chase and a uh, big event in. in in my life because it led to me meeting other people and what we'd done we, we'd gone out uh what we call sneaking on one day and the ladder was with uh, just said a couple of words to another bloke randomly because he was pushing his bike with a puncher and uh it was a an off-duty copper two days before that we didn't know this at the time but the ira had just been caught at the border in in near germany and uh, that copper heard our accent and just thought Irish straight away. And he just told them that they just heard a couple of Irish blokes joking with him about his thing here. They put two and two together and come up that we was Irish. But 
who wasn't, and was in a stolen uh, Toyota Supra at the time. And uh, I was a driver, I was driving. And we got into the car, just drove away, not knowing anything was coming in the background. And uh, a couple of police motorbikes came out of, literally came out of the bushes, through the bushes, where we stopped at traffic lights. But they sort of got in each other's way and left the gap, so I'd gone through the gap. And then the chase started. And it lasted for quite a bit. I refueled anyway, that's how long it lasted. And we drove through. In the end, there were six bullet holes in the car. And uh, we got caught up a tree about four hours later. And, but they, they thought when, when, we, when the chase first started, there was a police motorbike coming behind us. And we'd gone round a big bend because I'm in a big car. I was able to stop pretty quick. But he wasn't, and he hit the back of the car, and he flew over the top of the car. So the call went out, officer down, IRA suspects. That was the call. So then they just went fucking crazy, just shooting at everything, and I just I started driving even faster. Got away from them all, went through roadblocks and everything where they were shooting, and uh, ended up sort of dump, not dumping the car, but the car grounded it in a big field. After quite a bit of chasing, it just it had enough, and we had, we had up a tree, and it took them about two hours to find us. And when they found us, they pistol whipped us and took us off to Aston Police Station, and they kept us there. And I ended up getting eight months for it, nine months, sorry. That's not too bad. No, but I was still on the run for for this five uh, months for the five month shite. So I should have got rid of it mm -hmm. because it was just a ball ache. So then something in my mind decided that. I didn't want to go back because I knew there was going to be gate arresting me and taking me back. And I decided to try and escape from Groningham, uh, it, what was called the uh, Huis van Boering, which is uh, like a local jail type of thing, uh, not a high security. And I had windows in, so a couple of Turkish, who I didn't know at the time, but ended up being quite powerful Turkish people from the Kurd side of it. They got us some razor wire in and I cut myself out got through all the bars but one. On the last one, the wire snapped. So then the following morning they came, it was, that was the end of my sentence. I was expecting to get deported straight back to England. They took us to Groningen Police Station, kept us there, was there for about two or three weeks. And uh, the, the coppers were trying to get hold of the British Embassy, but they never came up. So they just one morning, they just come, took me down, the sergeant just said, go on, fuck off, literally. Just said, go on, I had two guilders in my pocket and, and nothing. And I managed to get hold of a couple of lads that came and picked us up and then it all just started again then. So see when you've got one day <coughs> left in the Dutch jail? Yeah. Were you not thinking, man, if I escape here, I could get another few months on because you didn't want to finish the five in England? Were you that adamant that you didn't want to serve your time in Yeah, just England? going back to England because it takes you out of the, the system and I thought that I'd learnt a lot of people there and I didn't want to lose the chance of that because once you, you're out of people's sight, you're out of super people's sight in, in crime. You know, unless you're in the, the middle of it, nobody's ever going to come and speak to you about it. You have to find them. And that, that was the thing, you know. That's why I tried to escape, because I didn't want to go back for the five months. Not because I was scared of the five-month sentence. I didn't want to go back. You knew you'd be taken out of the system altogether. What kind of money were you making at that period of your time? It was just what we, we were thinking. We were sneaking. Just the but we believe, harsh? No, we weren't doing any drugs at this this moment. We stopped. Yeah, we were just thieving, really. But we, we was getting, you know, we could go places and get 80 grand out of a supermarket quite easily. So, what? 80 grand? Yeah, a big supermarkets. Yeah, they're massive, don't forget, no those days. No guns? No, just sneaking. They, they, they used to have uh, a cab, like a little glass office in the middle mm -hmm. of them. All of them, Aldi, all, all the big ones, all the Dutch ones. And they used to have people in them and sometimes they didn't. But the, the, I'll tell you, it was, a, it was hard. You, you had to you make three choices to find the key. It was either in the keyhole, it was on top of the safe, or it was on the drawer. They never really bothered hiding it. It was there, or the safe was open and the bag was ready there to take out. But there's people stealing hundreds of thousands at the time, the lucky ones. Yeah, Eight, so 80 was our big, big one. So if you're making good dough then... What made you go d deeper into the... Well, it, it's because we made the dough from that that I was able to go back Fund. into... into yeah, yeah, that funded that. Uh, we funded, uh, again, a, another massive disaster. We funded, uh, well, I funded the thing to Ibiza, sending stuff down there. But 
three months later, the kid came back about six stone lighter and fucking had about 10 pence in his pocket. Partly before Just all. parted it all, all the way down, so it was <laughs> starting from scratch again. It's fucking never ending. It's a revolving no. door of just disaster constantly, yeah. isn't it? Exactly. What was it then? Is it the buzz as well? Or did you think, like, fuck it, because your mum had passed away, you were wanted in England? Were you just thinking... I never got that buzz. No? It was just business all the time for me. I didn't get excited about these things all the way through. I just knew the, the, the downside of it, and the downside of it for me was that you end up in prison all the time. But even then, I sort of had a plan for what happened when I did get in prison. I just turned it into a college. thought that even when I was outside of college, uh, out of prison. So it didn't have any fear for me, the prison side of it. Yeah, because I know people, I've interviewed so many people now, and I've obviously had friends back in the mm. day that's nowhere near your level, but they can't stop. It's not, it doesn't become the money anymore, it becomes the buzz. I've had, do you know Andrew Pritchard? Do you know Pritchard? I've heard Genesis. Yeah. He done, he used to ship get shipments for Jamaica and ship them across, yeah. making that much money, but still, he couldn't get out, he couldn't quit, until eventually got a life sentence. And then obviously when he comes out, he still, it's the chase, what, is it the chase, the buzz, the money, the fucking... Just... No, I, I don't think I ever reached that level where I thought I could come out. Did you ever have a target in your mind that make a few million and then I'll quit? <coughs> yeah, I, I had like a 10 million market uh, le level in my mind, thinking that's what I'd need to keep, because I was on the run, to, to stay out and stay out safely. But uh, it was all bollocks, wasn't it? <laughs> 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 You just keep going when you're thinking the next one, uh, we'll stop after the next one and then the next one goes down. And There's so many ups and downs of it, you know, you, you're planning and planning, thinking it's going to come, it's going to come, and then, but you've lost a year planning it. Mm -hmm. So easy to, to, a year goes by. I mean, I, I, I don't want to complain about it, but I spent fucking 12 months in Venezuela on a desert, a tropical island, waiting for some of that never came through. You know. Was that from Colombia? From, yeah, Venezuela, Colombia. Mm -hmm. Colombia first, then to Venezuela, and then we'd meet in the middle of the ocean and it'd get passed over. So when did you start making waves? When did you start becoming target, like, public enemy number one? When, when I met Curtis, really. It was after that. Uh, I was it was quite a high target before that, and we'd done... Uh, I'd done a few smuggles, done a couple of kamikazes where I walked through the customs with 24 kilo in on my own. And there's nothing else in the case. But we never got caught for that, so that wasn't in the radar. But then we got wrapped up in our, our own thing where, because the Met Curtis in prison. Uh, we'd already smuggled from uh, Curacao, which is in the Dutch Antilles. And we got caught for that because of undercover and different things happened there. And that's where I met Curtis. And it was after that when I got out, because after the escape, uh, Curtis was still inside at the time. And uh, made contact when his case collapsed after that, and then the two of us got together, and that was it. We yeah, cracked on. So, seeing you'd done the 24 kilos in the case, yeah, what was it? Cocaine. Where did you get that from? Ecuador. How much a kilo? It was on a couple of thousand. Yeah, I was getting 20,000 for it back there. Pure, yeah, it was all 90 odd percent. Yeah, it was just that was in that was always in the case. The case must have been fucking heavy, yeah, it was heavy, yeah. Was that, that must be a buzz for you though, knowing that, that's not I'll get caught, you're going to get a fucking 15 or a 20. No, no, the the the, the reason why I, I did it, again, you know, I didn't just do things mm -hmm. because I thought, Ecuador, it was a death sentence. If you got caught with it there, it was a death sentence. You'd never come out of prison. But we had, we had it put on by the military. So when, when, when you walk up, you walk up to the, the place where you put your bag on, and in my case, there was a, a colonel stood behind the, the, the thing, you watching the bag. It was the military who controlled everything there rather than the police or customs. And uh, he followed the bag onto the plane. So it was put onto the plane. And then I had to take it off at the other end. And had I got caught, I would have got between three and five years. That's that was it. Bad. So the gamble, on that one, the gamble was worth it. One way or another, I would have ended up with either 24, or my share of the 24, I was only... A, like a mule at the time, but that was in the again the middle eighties, really. Was your ass making buttons? Uh, a little bit, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Once you're going through, and, it's all right while you're on the plane. Nothing's <laughs> happening to you. You're eating the food. Yeah. Everything's happy days. But that little fifty meter walk, whatever it is, 
Is that another light bulb moment <coughs> for you to say, okay? Because there's not much, was there much um, customs in that back then, 80s? Yeah, yeah, there was, there was you know. Still but, rife. But it wasn't anywhere like it was. You couldn't get away with that now, definitely yeah. not. But yeah, so don't try yeah, this at kids. It, it, don't, yeah, don't, don't try, try this at home. Kids. Yeah, the, uh, they were still heavy with the customs, but the sentences was, was light if you got caught. Did you cover it with anything because there were sniffer dogs or was it just pure yeah. kamikaze number? Foam. That's it. Foam on it. Yeah. No, it, it seems, did have a, some smell. It had all, all the pick a lily type stuff on it. You know, but that's a thing that most people cover it with. So it's not too bad against the dogs, but because you don't want the dogs repelling against it because that's a marker for the police as well. So just something nice and mild. And it. I don't think it was that heavy. People weren't checking that heavily all the time because where, where even though it was Curaçao where, where I came back from is known as an import place for drugs it wasn't that bad in the middle 80s sort of thing so what did you get the jail for when you met Curtis uh, for the Ecuador from Colombia and stuff like that that came through there and was bringing it ourselves but it was into Holland really but it got diverted into England was that just intelligence on you, or did you get caught with stuff? No, they was working with a, a Belgian importer who was had quite a bit of transport, transport being the key, and he was moving quite a lot of stuff about, and he said he could move stuff to England for us, so we tested him with a 40 kilo, and then uh, in, in the background, he was working out a different one where he was getting it from Curaçao into Holland, that's where that conspiracy should have started and finished, in, in Holland again. But he then got in touch with uh, the Dutch police, who he didn't get in touch, but somebody heard about it and the Dutch police told the English police about it. Uh, the, the Dutch police refused to be involved in it because they don't do that type of thing in Holland, where they're setting people up with, with stuff. And then the English uh, decided that they'd run it because it was me or English people. They didn't really know me at the time. And uh, the English set it up. They flew over to Curaçao without permission. Didn't have any permissions from the English, uh, from the Curaçao government or the Dutch government. Well, in fact, they had the opposite. They had refusals to to allow it to go on. And they still went and did it. And the dr drugs got passed to them. Then they flew out to uh, Miami. Uh, they got arrested in Miami, the undercover coppers. So, that, again, that's another thing that they breached, the, the American laws of importation. And then the Americans allowed them to import it to England. So it was a, it was a, it was a bad case by then. Corruption? Cor oh, definitely. Agent provocateur was not the word, really, in those days. But uh, the judge ended up saying, well, the end justifies the means with people like you, so... In other words, the police was allowed to go out and smuggle drugs in and out of a country without permission, smuggle them even into America without permission and get away with it completely. What did you get for that? I got 22 years. That was a 22. But you escaped? The, uh... Uh, escaped, yeah. They moved us then to uh, to Risley, waiting for... Uh, Sentencing? Sentence. Did you know you were getting a 22? No. Well, things was changing in, in, in those days. Uh, at the beginning... I always expected about a 12 uh, and the system started to change uh, where there was more or less doubling everything. Robberies, drugs, everything got doubled and I, I hit the bad period where it became something I was expecting 11 for, I got 22 for. Make an example of you? Uh, yeah, I suppose it was. It was. Because that's a big stretch with murderers. Even, even in those days it was a big stretch but obviously the, the judge was sentenced me and I was in uh, Liverpool in a flat. And I should have been stood in front of him. So yeah, I think he was a bit angry as well. She's probably just... At the end of a six-month trial, that I wasn't there anymore. How did, how did I be allowed to get away? But uh, again, but it was also in the days before the the, the horse box type transport, we went on an old coach. So it wasn't as bad as what it sounds, or as bad as what the police made it out to be as well. Yeah, like, because you know. when you, you escaped, they says they had bazookas, machine guns and... Yeah, everything. How many days before your sentencing did you escape? Uh, the day before, like just the day before. Yeah, yeah. And you're just thinking, "Fuck this." <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very strange because on on the day of the 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 the, the thing, uh, April first, fools, April first, nineteen ninety three, uh, and normally you get moved in the morning. 
we normally gone by 10 o'clock at the latest, really. And this was 1 o'clock had come and we're still there. Uh, about 2 o'clock after dinner, we got called down. And I'd been cuffed to this uh, other lad all, all the way through all this. And then all of a sudden his name gets shouted out and cuffed to another person. So I've, I've got in the background that I'm fucking escaping here and he's the man who's going to drag me off the coat sort of thing. He's the, the muscle for it. And he gets put onto a thingy. So I've gone from a six foot six big black man who's going to help me get off the coach to uh, a young lad who, you know, he had, he had no idea what was going to happen until he put his foot on the coach step, on the bottom step. And I said to him, something's going to happen here, mate. And he went, what, what, what? And we was up on the coach by that time. And uh, But I, I didn't think he'd still be there, the lad waiting outside, because it was just one person. There was no big gang outside with guns or anything. It was uh, each stopped the coach and I had to get off the coach. That was that was the deal. So nobody was coming into the coach and doing any of that. So uh, he'd waited all morning. He stole the car that morning and he was sat on the the the, the car park of, of Risley Prison all morning in a stolen car. So he took some balls to sit there all that time without anybody coming near him. And he, we set off, and as soon as we come out of Risley, there's a roundabout there. And as we'd done the first junction, a police dog van has pulled up onto the, the other junction, coming onto the roundabout. And I'm looking at that van, and he's just stopped the coach. So he's right in front of the coach, waiting for me to come off the coach. But then he's looked and seen the police van, and the police van has just shook his head and drove off. So he's still more probably shaking his head now that he didn't carry on because that was his chance then I suppose I'm gone further up on the dual carriage when he repeated the the operation and managed to stop the coach I just shouted nobody move and luckily I was big enough and thing I was a lot bigger then and nobody moved for a, a few minutes and we managed to get to the front of the coach and get off and jump into the car and was off to sunny Liverpool for a few months where I sat in a flat waiting for transport to get out <clears throat> I don't think I moved for five months. Just sat in a flat waiting, being fed. How did you get away? <clears throat> How did you get abroad? Oh, got in a private what? plane. Private plane? Yeah. Flew off from a small airport in somewhere near Leeds. Landed in a uh, uh, little, uh, little private place in, in, in Holland, Hilversum Airport. And just got off and walked up. Nobody there. What's going through your mind when you're getting a 22 shoved up your ass to the <coughs> becoming free? Were you thinking, this ain't going to last long? Or do you have that mindset just to try and flood everywhere with drugs, make as much money as you can and try and live in a deserted fucking island? How, what was no, going through the, your the, mindset? Well, when I was sat in the flat in Liverpool watching the, the Granada reports that night, fucking, I was, it, was, it was a shock, to say the least. I was, like I say, I was expecting 12, 14 maybe. And then the 22 came up. Okay, I couldn't move for about two hours. Just rooted there, I think, what the, you know, what, why so severe? And it was a good job I was where I was. But it was a bad mistake for me, that. I shouldn't have thinking it, because it, it takes away all your appeal chances and stuff like that, you know. I'm sure if we had appealed it properly under the, the time limitations, I could have won that case completely. I've always looked back and thought that, but I don't hey, worry about it anymore. What about when you're... Why did they give you a sentence before... You were, at, you were standing in a dock? In your absence. <clears throat> yeah. Sentence in your absence, yeah. We do that all the time. And that, and w when they do that, they know that, that that creates a time clock then. You've got 28 days to appeal. And after that, you've got no appeal. It took me 14 years once I've been arrested to actually get an appeal in and get it to the European Court, who more or less told me to just fuck off and stop my us. He just said, the, this appeal is non-appealable. Don't appeal it anymore. Uh, and that even the, the European Court used that sentence. In this case, the end justified the means. They said it a few times, that. So you met Curtis Warren on, rem on remand? Yeah, he, he was in uh, Strange Ways. And then you get out. How long after did he get out? When you uh, were it was on only the a few months, about five months, six months. And he was willing to take you on board even though you had a life ha hanging over your head? Uh, did he not think that movie brought heat? Towards him? No, because the heat was already on it. <laughs> <laughs> still, it still is. Actually, Ed, he's getting out soon. Yeah, yeah, next year. Yeah. 
So, what was the plans then when you two came together? I didn't Did, have any was plans. It, was just, it just a, a, yeah. a, a, a perfect match to then? We, we seemed to meet in together well because I had the contacts in, in Holland and uh, he had his own contacts as well, but he, he had uh, other people there when I got there. He had a nice big flat and everything, but he was being charged ridiculous money for the stuff and I could get it nearly eight grand a, a key cheaper than what he was paying at the time. So I ended up started supplying everything that he needed for all over Europe, really. And that's how we just started doing it. How were we you just worked together well at the time. How were you accepted in Amsterdam? Because obviously the Dutch Europe, you've got the Albanians, you've got the Turkeys, like they don't fuck about, man, and they're, they're heavy. Like, how was the cut like, they like the English. From English? The Dutch like English. Yeah, were you so, accepted? Nobody tried to take you out? No, no, well... I'm very diplomatic, me when I when I'm out there. It's uh, I started to learn the, the language as well. That helps with the Dutch. Oh, you, you just think it, you, certain things happen in life, don't they? I mean, I moved into to an house. We had, we had a, a a beautiful apartment in in the centre of Amsterdam, but because I was on my toes, I didn't want to be in the centre of Amsterdam. So I moved out to a place called Vinkerveen, which is out in the countryside. Uh, quite high up on the, on the Amstel. So I was living on the Amstel River. And I don't know whether you call it synchronicity, I don't know what you call it, but it was just the way... When when me and Curtis sat down with this old bloke, who he'd, he'd called, he was called Vout. And uh, funny, funniest bloke, you know, he couldn't speak a word of English. So me and Curtis, I could speak Dutch by this time. And uh, we were talking away with him and he... he he knew what we was doing, even though he never said anything at first, because I, I moved into to his house, but I didn't know this at the time, but he, he just had the pub there for 50 years. So he knew everybody in the area. And then he took the pub down and built two houses. He lived in one and rented the other one out. And it was on the Amstel River, and it came with a, like a riverboat with it and everything. It was a beautiful place. And he'd seen a few things going on this vault from next door, proper old cloggy type geezer and uh one one day we'd uh we, we was doing something that we shouldn't have been doing and a wagon had come and he'd seen it for a few minutes and he'd, he'd never said anything and some fucking tires that we was doing down went away and a few other things happened and he's come the following day and just threw a, a business card on the table and it was in the middle of a drought of uh, of ash you couldn't buy soaps or anything anywhere and it had on the, on the back of it Zapiers, which is Dutch for soaps, uh, 3,200 guilders. Uh, and the other side, I turned it over the other side, it was a solicitor's card. So it must have been a little joke from Vout saying, you know, fucking, we know what we're doing, here's, here's a card. So I said, what's all this? He said, oh, it's just people we know. Uh, they, they can get this for you. So they must have known it, there was a drought as well. And then we found out that it was the people from the Bulldog who was, was his... Uh, there was his grandkids who owned the bulldog and we, we rented his fucking house out. And the next one, within a couple of hours, it had 100 kilo of, of ash on the table, sorted out by our next door neighbour who was an old Dutch bloke. So synchronicity just seems to float in. Oh, and after you. that point, I had Vout driving me about because I was on my toes and he, he used to drive all my cars. I used to sit in the back. So I had a, a Dutchman, I even got him to buy the, the cars himself in his name. So he never got stopped, and I never got stopped in the back of his car. How so. is that, though, to have a, a lifer hanging over your head? You're making money. Could you could you enjoy it, or were you still just constantly... No, just, you, just, you can enjoy it a little bit, but you're very cautious. You can't do anything. You're not going to clubs and pubs and bars and all that. That's a go, go away. Uh, sometimes the people around you don't seem to appreciate that sometimes, because one of my good friends went out on a night out, and I'm living in this place, and this is before Vout knew about it, and I've come home and the big double patio doors and he's come home pissed without his keys, he's lost the keys. But instead of sitting about waiting, he's smashed the doors in and gone up to bed and just gone to sleep. And I've come home to an house with the door kicked in, there's stuff all over the place in there. And uh, he's drunk, so yeah, all that drinking and thing, you had to stop after that. And yeah. we had to just become quite military, I suppose, in, in our own little way. Do you feel that benefited <clears throat> you being not, not drinking, not taking drugs? to then become one of the biggest yeah. in the UK instead yeah. of a lot of people tend to 
I know it's a cheesy line, but get high in their own supply kind of things. Yeah. I like to party, show off all the all the all the girls fancy lifestyle. Yeah, no, and they seem to sink faster. Yeah, definitely sink faster. You can't be doing things like that under them conditions. I did smoke at the time, and as soon as it started getting sick, even that I couldn't take. It was just too much. What were you smoking? You know, I've hash just or smoke a bit of ash. I never liked the weed. Got paranoid as fuck, though, man. Well, you do, yeah, you do. That's Set why I stopped it. The door yeah, coming straight in. away. <laughs> you know, especially <laughs> at that level where things are happening all times of the day. You know, I could. I could uh, there was a certain day when I first started doing a bit of uh, buying and selling for people. You know, I was turning over a million pound a day sometimes, just buying drugs for people. Once he knew that I was there and I, they could drop money off with me and, and order things and the stuff would appear, you know, sometimes it was a good million a day just going through your hands and then it just gets moved on to people from all over the, all over Europe, really. It wasn't just England, it was all over. A good Switzerland, yeah, yeah, everywhere. A good metal man. Yeah, yeah, just because of the contacts. And a lot of the contacts came from that old vault because once we met the, the, the bulldog people... That was it then, it was open to, to everybody in, in Amsterdam and the, the Turkish people as well, you know, because I knew them from the prison, they, they, they'd do everything. There's people there all the time, the, the, the Turkish side of it. It was big on the ass side of stuff, because they, they knew a lot of Moroccans and what have you. But yeah. How do you go, how do you build trust then, knowing that, if so, in that game, listen, there's, there's no loyalty amongst thieves, but... How do you build a trust and a, and a bond that people ain't going to fuck you over and maybe get stuff from you and then stick you into the coppers where you know you're going to get a life sentence? Did that ever cross your mind? Uh, towards the end, yeah. I even think that the last, uh, the, the 430 kilo, we, we, we was uh, the lame duck in it because at the same time there was a big thing going on in Holland called the ERT affair where they was doing containers full of cocaine, 22,000 kilo at a time. And it was a police, customs, and who, who knows who else who was do, doing it. And that was running parallel to what we was doing at the same time. And I, I met the, 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 the boss of that when I was in the Triple Cat A in Holland. And he was called Cobus, the King of the Gypsies. And he told us at the same time we was doing that, they was doing it from the same place, more or less. So we could have just been the, the lame duck and just throw them in and then ours will go through type of thing. I always thought that. The bait? Yeah, it was just a bait for, for somebody else. Fuck, see, I thought 400 was a lot, but 22,000 no, 22, kilos. Right out but they did, uh, I think they did nearly up to 100, ki 100 uh, containers before they got caught. But only certain people got caught, and the uh, the amount of money was just ridiculous. It was hundreds of millions uh, everywhere that they caught. But they never caught the big people at the top. Because the, 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 the lad I met... He had a get out of free card letter from the government, the Ministry of Justice, saying if you tell us the names, you can go home now with your money. And that was in the in the millions that he had. Did he? No, he had hundreds of millions. He got, he got millions from uh, repatriation because he was like the boss of the gypsies of, of Europe, really. And the, the German repatriation fund, I remember he got nearly a million guilders put in his account from that in, in prison, just so he could buy what he wanted and rub it in the guards' faces a for little bit. For his canteen? Yeah, for his canteen, yeah. <laughs> he just, I'm only in Quinn. He just used to buy everybody's canteen. He was Well, there's only three of us on the wing, but he just used to say, just buy what you want. Mm. I'll pay for it all. How did you end up in contact with the Cali Cartel? Uh, it started with a couple of different ways, really. It was, again, through the people we knew already, and then Curtis had his contact from previously. Uh, and that that was a very strange first meeting as well with with Lucho, who was the the head of the cartels. And I went to uh, Bogota for the first time, and um, we went on a meeting. First time I'd met Lucho, and all his lieutenants was there. It was, it was like walking into a courtroom, really. I didn't know it at the time, uh, but they'd not heard anything about what had happened. So uh, three thousand plus a thousand Kurdish got involved with had gone missing so they'd lost 4,000 kilo 3,000 involved with Curtis and not with Curtis with, with the uh, Europeans from Belgium and Holland and everybody was still either in prison or had not come back to tell them what had happened and that was the first questions with, with the 
Uh, I had the, the friend who'd gone over with me, Michael, we were talking, laughing about it this morning, about how how tall he stood on the on the meeting. You know, he stood there with his chest out and everything because it, it was his, he'd never been at that level before neither. And uh, as soon as the questions started coming out, his, his head went down. He just got lower and lower. And he, in the end, his fucking shoulders was up like that. That's why we ended up calling him No Neck. <laughs> started off proud as punch and then ended up fucking shoulders shrunk. Yeah. Because he was saying, you know, what happened to our 4,000 kilo of cocaine? We well, want to know. And they was asking it me. And uh, I told them who I was. And there's people walking in and out, checking who, who I was and looking into whatever they were looking into because I think they had quite a high intelligence uh, network set up. And they were checking out who I was. And, and eventually they realised that what I'd said, that I'd, I wasn't involved in that. I was doing my own thing and I was in prison, I met this bloke there and I don't know about that side of the story but this is what I do know, I told them and apparently I was lucky to walk out of there. It was uh, more or less a question and an answer thing and if you got the answer wrong you weren't going home. So oh. that's why No Neck shrunk because he was listening to it in Colombian, mm. in Spanish. So I missed quite a bit of it so I just got the highlights of what happened to our 4,000 kilo. Did they think you were involved in it? Yeah, at first, yeah. yeah. But what's going through your mind then? If you <coughs> say something wrong, you're dead. Do you, do you panic or do you try and stay as calm as possible? No, you stay, you, you've got to stay calm. You can't, if you panic, you're dead. So you, you've got no choice. I don't know. You just carry on. Because I knew I had nothing to do with it. And if you do get wrapped up in it, well, what, what can you do? I'm looking at, well, there's six main uh, Cali cartel leaders and who knows what was outside. I know there's quite a few bodyguards out there, so you're not going anywhere. And we was in a big penthouse on the top of a, a big shopping centre that they owned. So it was controlled all the way down, so you just had to answer the answers. And big no neck, what was he? He <coughs> shit himself. In. Oh, completely. Uh, he, he, I could say he was fucking six foot six when he walked in. He fucking, yeah. I could come midget donkey palm when he walked out. He's walking in feeling proud as if he's going to meet top boys and organising deals, yeah. but. You have got it put on. Yeah, he soon changed. Four thousand was. Yeah, it became. Uh, but four thousand kilo. What's that fucking? That's over a hundred millions worth. Yeah, it's, it's nothing to them though. They're, you're talking twenty thousand kilo. He, he was sending. Lucho was sending three thousand kilo a week to America, and uh, every week the same plane that took the cocaine brought the money back. That was just one of his things. He, he was the leader at the time, but he's 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 in America now. He's, I think he's thirty floors underneath below ground and he'll never come out again when they, when they went and got him a few years into my sentence the uh, he went out on a night out into bogota and that was the last he knew he woke up fucking three stories below ground and that's where he'll be forever he'll never come out again fuck's sake man what's these people like what when you meet them are intimidating or just no no minded? just you Calm. just you just you just mm. looks like you suit on shirt on calm as you like wouldn't even know you know they're not uh, but you, you see them the entourage that they have with them the bodyguards that they have with them everybody's got uh, it's not overtly aggressive it, they, 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 they do hide the guns but when you're pulling up to their houses that's when you see what the, the capabilities of a man and what they've got and what they own just a different world then did you ever move over there? yeah well when you done the twelve, when you done the eight, you stayed in the island. <coughs> was, that, was that you trying to set up a deal that it took six months to twelve months to do the first deal? Yeah, it took us a uh, good twelve months where I did nothing, just waiting for things. It's coming this week, it's coming next week, uh, mm -hmm. the, and there's always problems. Is that I, to test you though and wait to see if it, it could have been? But no, no, they they wanted to get it going, but it, it was quite it's quite a complicated thing to to organise where a plane drops it to to boats those are first things that we was trying to do not the container side of it and getting everything in place and, and avoiding the americans as well obviously one a couple of times we, we didn't avoid them uh, a couple of times the boats was out there and the americans were sat waiting for them whereas a couple of boat a boat had gone over the plane had gone over seen the american clippers and just turned around but the boat was still out there and then when they pulled into uh I think it was Curacao that they pulled into. They pulled in to put more supplies on the on the on the on the yacht they was on, and the the American clippers sort of more or less pulled up at the side of them. 
And they boarded the boat and told him that we've been watching you for three days. And what was all that about? You turning round and going round in circles and things. We know what you was doing, sort of thing. So they, they was watching him for fucking hundreds of miles away. So I was lucky on that one. See when you lose. Oh, they was when you lose a parcel. Huh? Because if you're getting parcels like that, imagine it's not cash up front. Do you, how, no, no. How, so, how does it work? Does it? Do you need to pay half back or do you need to pay full back? The, the the system that I always worked on because it was me that was there doing the, them final details was that it was always fifty fifty. The Colombians used to say, "Well, you know, one, once it's back to Europe, we want fifty percent at European prices. We don't want these prices because it was only about two grand, two thousand dollars a kilo at the time." And I always used to insist that you know what happens when something goes wrong. You know, is it whose fault is it? And it was always had to be agreed that it was no one's fault, provided it was proper. We had to have proof of it, people in prison, etc. And uh, they, they just expect the European price, but not the top European price, a reasonable U European price. Mm -hmm. I think we was offering them $15,000 a kilo for their stuff, if I can remember well. So that meant we'd make a few thousand on top as well, on selling their stuff as well, because we still had to make sure it was safe as well. So you were just bringing it to Europe and <coughs> selling it in Europe? Yeah, I was or just selling it in Europe. Money, obviously, there's more money to make in the UK. No, not really, no. I was making more money not? in Switzerland at the time. Why? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But there wasn't a <coughs> massive market in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, was, nobody's going to be buying hundreds <coughs> and hundreds, are they? Cause it's not. No, but the, the, at the time, when we was selling it, mm. we was buying it and selling it in, in Holland for like 20,000 guilders, a bit more sometimes. you get 60,000 in Switzerland for it. And you'd only get 30 odd 40,000 uh, guilders from England if you sold it there. So it was always better. Even Germany was better than England. Did you always know when there was a dry up <coughs> coming up? Or did that just. I'd imagine there would be no dry up with your contacts, but for people. No, there was. There was always dry ups. Yeah? Yeah, yeah there's always dry ups, yeah. I mean, if fuck the prices. But was that. Are they planned? If you some. If, yeah, who knows? You go for kilos of coke, yeah. 30 grand, then they got to 50 if there's a dry up that. Yeah, if it, if it, but the, there was never a dry up when when there was plenty there. You, you couldn't because people didn't want to hold on to it for a couple of reasons. The people in Colombia wanted the money back, so you can't hold on to it. But people used to buy it and sit on it quite a lot. But yeah. I, I once uh, we, within a, a couple of months of being involved with, with some of the, the Colombians, uh, a couple of them that I knew pretty well would think nothing of dropping a thousand kilo off and just coming back a couple of weeks later for, for the money. You know, it's fucking crazy. It's crazy. It? Hey, we're, we're, one weekend, we're, we're gone. And uh, it's, it's no name, nobody will know the name. Let's say little Jimmy, he was was one of them. And uh, it was, it, when I say only 200 kilo now, you know, it's obviously quite a lot. But it was 200 kilo and we, we bought a, a special car, Citroen XM, which had, uh, you put three, 400 kilo without it showing. But it was just like an estate car, and then Citroen with the hydraulics on it. And we'd gone and we'd put the, the, the stuff in the boot. And the, the idea was that we swap cars, we, we get his car, and uh, he gets the, the car with the drugs in, and we get the car with the money in. So we, we, we'd gone, and he said, oh, we'll, we'll sort everything out later. So the two drivers have come and gone away, and then the following Monday he's come back and said, where's the money? I said, what do you mean, where's the money? I said, it's in the car, mate. And he'd been driving about in Amsterdam, going out partying two, three o'clock in the morning. A good few million pound in the boot. And luckily, it was still there. <laughs> so that could have gone bad either way for both of us. But, you know, it was a different days, different times as well. You know, the trust was there then. Back then, it's, I don't think it's there anymore. Sad that, isn't it? So much happened in between them, them years of, yeah. of when I was doing it to now. I think people have just got too used to snitching. Yeah, all, um, all that. yeah. And snatching stuff off people as well. Yeah. So, did you find there was a lot of trust in the eighties <clears throat> and nineties when you were active? Yeah, for us it was. You know, we we, we had a good reputation if if that's what you can say it is. But it was it was a good reputation. Like I say, people used to drop stuff off and just leave it. Come back weeks later for it. Why do you in think the millions? I mean, why do you think that's the change? That uh, there's so many fucking wrongings and snitches now that. Like, what do you think that? Is? Do you think that's Part of the, the police putting pressure on people, well, bigger sentences, or I don't think the just police it, in those days had them options where they come up to you and say, "Well, you've just been caught with that. 
-hmm. tell us about something else and we'll let, let you go. That wasn't available. I don't think that's, I don't know, in, in the day it wasn't available in, in Holland anyway because they didn't allow them type of things to happen under their law. You, you can't set people up in, in Holland. It has to be a crime that you're committing. Uh, no, I don't know. There's something I missed. You know, I still feel that I went into prison and came out into this fucking alternate universe, mate, <laughs> from, yeah. from the past. It's fucked up, mate. Oh, it's yeah. completely changed. Yeah. Social media plays a big part in that as well, though. Yeah. Well, it's fucked with people's minds. Everybody's competing. Yeah. And people are doing it for the wrong reasons, but that's life. See, all the, all the, the kind, of, kind of families and that stuff you came across, you've got the Turks, the Albanians, the Colombians, the Americans even. Who was it? Who, who would you say is the most organised? Turkish. Yeah, they're massive, aren't they? Don't yeah. fuck about either, man. No, no, no. We had a, we had a few, uh, uh, let's say, well, how would you call it? We had a few Midnight Express moments in Turkey on the, on the thing. We bought a plane, and uh, the reason we bought a plane was a twin engine uh, turboprop Cessna, uh, carried 10 people. Um, one of the things that we was, we was hoping to do was to bring through the containers into Egypt, through Egypt into into Turkey. So we had to go and meet the people and we had to have a, a Colombian with us who was going to be the face that the captain had known, uh, the, the Egyptian captain. It was a big boat as well. He wanted a face. He wanted to see somebody. So we had to take him to Egypt. And uh, we'd been looking, me and my Turkish mate had been looking at buying a plane so we bought a plane, uh, started messing about in it, travelling in little bits and places. But the main reason to buy it was so I didn't have to go through the normal skip all type airports. And uh, fucking should have stayed with the main airports. It was a lot easier. And we flew to uh, Budapest, Hungary. Flew from there to uh, uh, Istanbul. Nearly died on that fucking journey because he never checked the weather and was going over the, the, the Urals. Uh, in a storm, a fucking lightning everywhere. The plane was dropping about 3,000 fucking feet in a second, lucky to land. And uh, we landed in, in Istanbul, got out, got on, into the, the, the airport, and as the, the Colombian put his passport in, he they gave him his passport back. Fucking hell, he only walked about five steps. There was machine guns pointed at him and everything. Didn't have any criminal record, it was just like the way he came. So they, they wouldn't let him back out. They could only go, they only allow him to travel back to Turkey, I mean to uh, Colombia, on one plane, and they put him on a plane and thingy. So the attention then came on us. But we was dressed, uh, well, I had the, luckily I had the co-pilot's uh, uniform on, and he, he, the Turkish lad, had the pilot's licence and uh, uniform on. So we was in the transit part now for three days, on and off. So the, the, the initial... Everyday police had interviewed us and there's nothing wrong. But we both had the same passport, more or less, English passports. So we've got a Turkish man, completely Turkish, you know, they, they knew he was Turkish, talking to him fluently. And uh, my passport was only a few numbers away from his. A bit of a bad mistake, really, shouldn't have been so close. But the passports we had was perfect, they couldn't have been broke. It cost a lot of money at the time, but my face was in the pictures in the passport office and my details was in there even though it was in someone's name and date of birth and everything and uh, they stand up to any scrutiny and they tried to break the, the passport tried to break him saying this is not your passport you know we know who you are we know that you're not english we know they said but yeah i'm english i've got an english passport so they had to let him go but we got in the plane and gone to set up and then another lo load of fucking police have come and stopped us on the runway again and then we had to get off the plane again. There's nothing on the plane, so we was, we was okay, apart from the fact that I was on the run for this. And uh, he was wanted as well in different countries. And then we, we went through the, the special squad and then the, the, the intelligence blokes, we got on the plane again. And I think they were just laughing at us, you know, in the background. Oh, I'll let him get on the plane again, we'll stop him again. Three times he did it. On the runway came and blocked the plane from going. And eventually we got back in the plane and set off and landed in Egypt. But we couldn't get the Colombian into Egypt neither because they just they want to allow him to come in. They have to have all visas and things for them because that was in the bad days of Egypt. And uh, we went from there to Alexandra by road and 
set up what we could set up, but we never did anything. We were just a load of bollocks. But we nearly ran out of fuel on the on the way into Egypt because when we landed at Cairo Airport, they didn't have fuel for the smaller planes. They only had the big plane fuel, and we had to fly to a smaller airport over the, over the the pyramids. And we literally landed on the plane spluttering. It ran out of fuel when we came in. Well, when we got there, we got the fuel. But we, I think we had to give about I think we give about a thousand bookshees out to people even to the, the the boss of the airport come here all the pips on and everything just kept putting they just put their hands out for money it's all they ever wanted there book she book she everywhere you went you know what thinking though why did you never just stay at a base are you just thinking fuck it i've still got to live my life doing all that traveling and through airports because that takes some balls yeah Don't if you get caught you're getting 22 stretch yeah well is that part of your mind though where you need to feel yeah. something no, no, the, the problem is, if I didn't go, who'd go? Yeah. Curtis really couldn't go because uh, he was watching him all the time. And you, you can't trust other people at that sort of level of negotiations. One of the bosses has got to go, otherwise he won't speak to you. You couldn't send somebody who just didn't know anything because when, when people like that ask you questions, you've got to know the answers. You can't be saying, oh, I'll go and ask somebody else. You know, it's an insult to them, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you're talking to the bosses you, you've got to act like a boss or be a boss you can't be somebody who's saying uh, well just let me check that no, you'd never see him again see the people you were getting your graph from did they know you were on the run yeah eventually yeah. Well, once I'd had a chat with them yeah. they would have loved that probably yeah well I think that saved my life really more <clears> than anything <throat> that they realised that you know if he's done that he's not a fucking thingy he's not this he's not that I can trust him and they did set me in properly do you get searched all the time when you meet these people? No, I never got searched. No. Never? No. In case you had a wire or anything, nothing like that? Uh, no, no. no. Once, once you knew my story, they knew where I was coming from. What about, um, did you ever come across the Mafia? Uh, the Italian? Yeah. Yeah, we met Americans. Some, we met some people involved in that, yeah. Never never dealt with them. Yeah, well organised though. I don't know if they mm. were as big as they were in the 80s and 90s and stuff, but... I never did anything with America, really. Uh, I always knew, we always, we always said it between us that, you know, fuck that, they'll come for you anywhere then. You know, we never moved or imported anything into or out of America. The only time I ever got involved in that was when the English Customs tried to import it into themselves, you know, on the, on the job that they did against us. But no, we, we avoided that purposely. See if somebody's fucked for four, somebody's done them for the Colombians for 4,000 kilo. Hmm. Say these people are in the UK, would the Colombians forget about that or would they put a hat out on that person in the UK? No, if they'd, if they'd stolen it, yeah, they'd definitely they'd send assassins everywhere. In them days, it was fucking right for it, wasn't they? They wouldn't mess about. But no, it was taken legitimately, if, you, if there is such a thing. The police took it. Mm -hmm. So it was quite an easy thing for them to, to track if they wanted to or if they knew which police forces and things. And it was all over the newspapers. My thing was all over the newspaper, so they didn't have to look far. So. You in the papers all the time in the news when you were still on your own? Or the kind of... Yeah, for, for a bit. Not, not too long. It, it, it died away pretty quickly. Did you feel that took a bit of heat and pressure off yourself? Or were they still getting your family and friends grief back home? No, no. It was, uh, again, I just think it was a different way of policing in those days. The, you know, like these days, if they find out somebody's on the run, then they are round at the families and all. But they didn't really. They might have been waiting outside and all that, but my family was, it was only me, I was the only black sheep in my family. And I think they knew every, every other member of my family was going out to work every day. So the police, they're not that daft, are they? they see who they are. And if you're all driving about in Ferraris, then the family's involved, but if, if they go to Manchester Abbots without killing cows all day, then they're not. Mm -hmm. So. Did you ever miss back home? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you always miss it. It's fucking weird, that, isn't it? Yeah. And I've then when you're there, you Spain fucking hate it, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, because it's a fucking weird. I've stayed in yeah. Spain and uh, uh, I've stayed everywhere and I always say, I'm fucking glad to get away and I always end up back. Do you, do you always look for the English food? Yeah. A little bit of shite. Shite, man. Yeah, shite. And it's just pure conditioning, but... Yeah. How long, did, how long did you end up on the run for? On that one, it was only three years, three and a, three and a bit years after the escape. But it was three and a half, three and a half years of my most productive criminal fucking part of my life forever you feel was that active what, all the time is that just because you knew you were going well, to I, was, I was trying to collect money trying to get safe all the time 
you know, I'd, I'd seen millions go through my fingers, hundreds of millions at some points, but it wasn't my money. Uh, the Colombians, and you don't steal off the Colombians, so it, it gets to where it's supposed to be going, and I take my share out of it, but it was never enough. I was always waiting for the big one, and then when the bigger one started coming in, it was shared by so many people that you don't end up with these fortunes. You know, how they come up with the figures that they've got with Curtis now, it's just ridiculous. Um, th that amount of money could have gone, well, it did go through our hands, but it never stuck to us. It was only on small percentages by the end of it, by the time you paid everybody. Because that's the thing as well, you know, you think about drug dealers and thingy, it, it's, you start off with one or two of you, and before you know it, there's fucking hundred people involved in it. You know, a hundred ways to be told that, or to be grasped on. You know, it's, it's a different world when you go into the bigger scale, because you can't move thousands of kilos with a couple of you. There's fucking hundreds involved in it. And if you involve the amount of people involved in, like, Venezuela and Colombia, I think it could be a few hundred people involved in a drug smuggle. But then, like I said, I think we wasn't just wasn't the only one. I think there was others going on at the same time. We were just another one, I think, we was put in because we was the smaller ones. Yeah, because you say, cut it's made over a billion. Bollocks. Absolute bollocks. Not a chance in the world. They, they, they make the figures up to confuse everybody and to make everything look worse than they are. They, they know the true figures when you're talking about hundreds of kilos. You know straight away if it's 400 kilos, 200 is ours. And out of the 200, you, you've got people, where, where do you put it? You've got to pay the stash houses, you've got to pay the transport people, you've got to pay everybody. Nobody gets involved in that game for just to be your mate. They want money. And by the time you share out your little bits at the end of it, it's little bits compared to what you started with. And I think that applies to the Colombians when they send it back. They've got hundreds of people in front of them. And that, that's one of the things why they say, why don't you ever stop? Well, i never seen enough money to stop. And then when you do, you lose this, you lose that. You know, when you're losing a million pound in one go, it takes a lot out of what money you've got. We lost 800 grand in fucking exchanging money in the bank one day. Mm. Well, it takes a long time to get 800 grand together. And then all of a sudden you take it to a bank to exchange it and they just say, well, we're seizing this now. As the day before, they didn't seize it. So there's always things happen, you lose money as well. Yeah, old new laws and stuff getting yeah. angry as well. So even though you're on the run for the, the three years, were you still having fun or were you just constant work to make as just, much as you can? At that time, it was just work. Just constant business? Yeah. Well, I say that, but like I say, 12 months of that was spent on a a nice tropical island in the Caribbean, so it wasn't that hard, was it? What was that like on the island? Uh, Lonely? No, no, it was a decent-sized island in Venezuela, off Venezuela, Isla de Margarita. But you could jump across on, on the ferry or a, a small plane quite easily to the mainland of, of Venezuela. But, yeah, it was nice living like that. I was living on uh, a nice big uh, house on the, on the beach. We walked across a little path, and it was at the ocean. I was waiting for the boats to come and the strange meetings that we used to have on the beach and, and they'd fly off. But then I was, I was flying in between there as well because when I was, I was doing my flying days, I did quite a bit of flying in Colombia and what have you. I shouldn't have done, but we did. Do you ever look at anybody, everybody that comes into your life, did you always look at them as maybe they could be un, having you under surveillance? Was everybody kind of, unless you knew them, everybody was kind of you were suspicious of? Yeah, no, no strangers came into my life at that time. It was all people we knew. Uh, apart from the Colombian side of it, it could have been anybody on that side. But uh, not, not in my personal, no. I never came into my space. Did you ever think about getting facial re reconstruction? Yeah, or? in Colombia. Yeah. What were you going to get done? Uh, I was going to end up like, looking like you, actually. <laughs> I was thinking that. <clears throat> yeah. Was that going through your mind just to go for the full <laughs> No, it the did. Works? Properly, yeah, yeah, the full lot, yeah. I was going to start with tummy tucks and all that, get rid of the <laughs> excess weight, and then go for my nose, because that would have been easy to change into a nice pointed one. Yeah, Why okay. did you know it? Uh, just, again, time. I, I, would, I think I would have done it. It was just things didn't fit into it, because you're looking at a few months again. Do you think that would have done anything, though? When did DNA that come in? 80s? 88, 89? Did they have, they would have had finger? They didn't have my DNA then, no. So you could have they had fingerprints. got away with it. Yeah, they had fingerprints, but I even looked at taking them off as well. 
that was available because it, at the time in Colombia, uh, uh, they, they had all the Miss World type thing. So plastic surgery was a very popular thing over there at the time. So yeah, I did go to see a doctor about it all and have a look. Yeah, could have been looking in the mirror by now. <laughs> and you did say, the fuck it, I'm not doing it? No, I, no I, I was. I would have took it further, but time and things got in the way of it all. Yeah, that's a big thing, though, isn't it? Yeah. That. But then again, it's your fucking life. If you've got a lifer, you're getting yeah. a lifer hanged over your head. That, or... It was just the fingerprint side of it. I, th I was always thinking that it's irrelevant what you look like. Once you put them fingerprints on, they've got you. So unless it was, it was never decided, the only thing that they could do was take off layers and layers of skin at the time so it was, you've always got your fingerprints haven't you so there's no way out of it yeah was it ever in the back of your mind that did it ever become tiresome or did you just working so hard that you actually forgot that you had 22 years hanging over your head no it just became it disappeared in the background I was just so busy with doing what I was doing it was I always knew that if I got caught I'm going straight back and then plus whatever I got caught for uh, no you, you either got to accept it or just crumble it does take some balls though to to keep going to be flying through airports like that. It's just listen. It's never acting just walking through. I walk through customs with fuck all on me legit, and my ass still clenches up as if I'm doing something wrong or I'm up to no good. Uh, through association, that though. Isn't like, it? Even when I get into shops and stuff, because I used to do shoplifting back in the day. Mm. Even when I'm in shops now, buying shit, I always walk through the alarms and think. Even when I hear it go off, I'm like, I'm not going to I'm ripping out the receipt straight away. Yeah. Panic still sets in. But yeah. for you, having a 22 hanging over your head, plus whatever you get caught for, you're potentially going away for a 35, 40. Was there ever any time you thought, fuck it, I'm out? Or were you just thinking, make as much as I can and keep no. pushing? And I, I, like I say, I never, I never got to that position where I felt safe. Or I had enough money to dissolve into some little island somewhere. Do you think that would have even made you stop, though? I don't know. I think so eventually i don't know you, you never know do you once that once you settled into knowing what you're doing and the day i escaped i regretted it really you know it wasn't something like that I mean, to be put in that position you failed really haven't you completely in, in, in your game that you think you've got to escape to get away from a 20 plus sentence you're starting off from a failed position really so i don't think it ever improved that so it was always there that I was coming back eventually you see kids now shifting a kilo two kilo and they think they're big ballers like you're shifting thousands hmm. and yet you felt like a failure at times did, did you ever question that then like when you had your job at 15 and 16 doing your art and you felt I should have maybe stuck into that or did that not cross your mind no, not not while I was actually actively on the run but it, it did come into me man I always thought what what would I do if I got caught well I can do my art I can do this I can do that I, you know, so the the fear of getting caught didn't really occupy my mind that much. I just cracked on, really. I, I think if you did, you'd just give yourself up, wouldn't you? Yeah. I'd turn, I'd go and knock on the fucking door and say, take me in, I can't do this anymore. But I never got to that stage, now. I suppose it's so interesting as well, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Travelling all over the world. Yeah. And I, I knew airports from before all this started, so I knew how to move about in airports, how to travel, how to going with the crowd as well all you need to do is go business class and nobody looks at you ever again once you step up to that even private planes man nobody blacks an eyelid well that's the problem that's why uh, we didn't finish saying it. that's what we did we bought a private plane so it's thinking but it's a fucking nightmare we've got stopped everywhere we went and ragged more than you do on the normal plane <laughs> uh -huh. so that got that got, <coughs> that got put aside for a bit mm -hmm. so how did you eventually get caught then uh Again, again, just people on them phones. Did you not have, were you using satellite phones? No, just normal phones. Uh, they was all over Curtis. Uh, they, about six months before we got caught, there was, uh, we'd gone, I'd living in a nice little house in a place called Sassanheim. And one of my friends had come early in the morning to go and play around the golf. And he'd, he'd spotted a couple of, strange looking cars with strange people in them and uh he's come round I have got in the car, drove round to the golf course and when when you're on the run you, you need escape routes. Uh I always used to pick the house because of the escape routes, not the other way around. 
and this place had a, a like what you call an horseshoe that comes back on yourself so you know that if somebody's following you they're going to come back on to you so when we drove down this road and then we come back around pretty quick onto this little like a cul-de-sac but it comes back onto the road and you, you pull out onto the road where they're coming up thinking that you're just parking or driving because there's no way out and you're facing them then you can see them and there was all there was two cars in a line with uh, eight blokes in them big blokes and straight away just police and then i just drove to paris that night never went back to that house left everything behind stayed in paris for a few days and then went back to a different part of holland in, in the north but they, they they was later on it was that point that they then it was english police who, who it was because we knew they was lost by coming the way they were coming if it was dutch would have been a bit harder to spot because they wouldn't have come down that road but the english and it was english police there illegally again and they was there just watching the house and they'd so, been there for quite a bit is that how they never jumped you then yeah they had no jurisdiction <clears throat> or no anything but uh it's also at that point though that that was when the english started lying to the dutch because if they would have said to to the the dutch that's Steve and me. That would have been it all over because the Dutch would have just stopped it all there, arrested me and put me in prison. They wouldn't allow a criminal who's, just, who's doing 22 years and escaped to be walking about in, on the streets of, of Holland. They just don't allow that type of thing. So the English must have lied to the Dutch there and then. And that's when the Dutch took over. But they, they said that they, they never knew who I was. They only knew who I was when they caught us. And three months afterwards, when they came after, they, they'd had my fingerprints for three months. Then they came into a, a local prison called Grava and took me out by helicopter and that was it. Triple cat aid for the rest of it. How much surveillance did they have on you? Uh, they had about rooms full, I don't know. It was buckets and articulated lorries full of information. I think they had so many thousand phone calls a day. Recorded? Yeah, recorded, yeah. And, and usable as well. It's a different law system there. Was that so? Did you get any add-ons for the twenty-two years you'd done for Amsterdam, or was it just no? The, the I got I had the twenty-two for, from England, mm -hmm. and uh, on the on the day I got seven years for from Holland, and uh, I appealed that, and they put that up to eight years, for, and they, they literally said for being cheeky. Added another year uh, yeah, on. Added another year <laughs> on for being cheeky because <laughs> it was such a low sentence for 420. Mm -hmm. The judge uh, put another year on. So uh, was that run concurrent or did it get extended? No, it was consec. So a 30 stretch? 30, yeah. yeah. And you so I had to do the Dutch sentence first, which was five year, four month. And then they shipped me back to England. Even, even that was a palaver. Helicopter to the, to the airport, uh, RAF jet to, back to England. I'd left a cell in, in Holland in Nijmegen down at the bottom and I was in high down prison within an hour in in, uh, in England. Did you ever think about escaping when you were doing your five? Uh, no, well, again, I was in Triple K, so... In Amsterdam? In, in, in Holland, yeah. There was only a couple of... Uh, from uh, October 96 uh, to uh, Christmas Eve when they came and got me Christmas Eve. In, and I think that was deliberate as well. And they waited till the fucking Salvation Army had just been. And then they came in and took me. Didn't even get to eat my hamper. And they, they took us out by... Uh, came in. Because it's... Over there when they're moving people like me, it's, it's not police, it's special military-type people who come and take... It's called the Arrestati team. And they came into the prison. The whole prison was shut down. And that's when they said that they found out who it was, actually who it was. So the, their brief would have been... This man's escaped with rocket launchers and machine guns and an armed gang had stopped an armed police convoy with rocket launchers and all that bollocks. But that's what the Dutch was working under. So when they came and picked us up from this Grava prison, which was just a normal jail, there was an helicopter. I, I came out, they, they came into the, the prison, closed the whole prison down with all the guns and everything, face down, fucking stripped naked, carried out face down put this fucking boiler suit on then they put goggles on helmet uh cuffs and bulletproof vest tied my legs put us in an helicopter and took us to grava took us to uh, a place called uh, new Vossaveld in in holland which was an old concentration camp 
and uh, put us in there, and that, that was it then. Triple K all the way. Everywhere we went was helicopters, and they took us once to court in police cars, armed police cars, not thingy, with, with a special team. And uh, they said they weren't happy with certain things that had happened, and they got reports that there was possibly going to be another breakout. And then they started moving us every time by helicopter then. That was it. So when they came in and tied you up, did you ever think that the bastards are going to kill me here? Yeah, yeah. The, the first, first on, the, on the arrest, could have been anybody, couldn't it? We just, we thought we'd just got in 400 odd kilos, so it could have been part, somebody come and take in that. Because there's nothing said. That when, when they came, it was just flashbangs and everything going off. I didn't hear anything anyway. And I was carried out completely naked, straight into the car, thrown in the, in, in the well of the car on, onto the floor. They didn't even put you in the seat. And then they came in and, and sat down and put the feet on you. That's how they, how they did it. Do you Professionally. Think, do you think <coughs> somebody stopped you in? No, it's just, uh, the, well, they say it was triangulations with phones. I was on the phone to Curtis. Uh, and the, I do believe this point because at, at that time when I was on the phone, where, where we was, it was a, a farm in the middle of uh, Newarkirk on the Isle. So there was nothing, there was another farm about a mile away and another farm that way. But there was nothing, there was no reason for any cars to come up there to go anywhere but to the, these two other farms that was there. And we knew it, I knew everybody who was there. And this car had come past and, you know, when somebody just looks at you for that split second, I should have just gone. Should have just started running across that field and carried on because they only came the following morning. But it's that intuition in it. I didn't abide by it and just carried on. But I was on the phone to Curtis. So that was driving up the road, obviously getting the triangulation or getting as close as he can. And luckily for them, I was stood outside in the garden talking. So I think that's how they got us. And what are you thinking then once you've been caught? Was that a relief or are you thinking, fuck me, how am I going to do this 22? <coughs> no, I was thinking I'm going to do more than 22. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. No, it? it's, it's weird. You don't, you, you fucking go a bit numb really. You know, it's hard to think about what's going to be happening in the next year. you just got to deal with it as you're going along. Because it's uh, one a nice feeling, obviously, but it, it happens. What's it's, the Dutch Jews like? Uh, well, they're not, normally they're fantastic, but when you're talking the triple cat A, it's, uh, it's fucking horrendous. Like really. Hannibal Lecter, kind of caged away, fucking nobody can see you. Yeah, but we've, uh, we've a bit of humanity thrown in there as well, because the Dutch tried as, as well as they can, but... Every, everything that, when they moved us into uh, New Vosweld, uh, the, the concentration camp, it was actual, it was the concentration camp that they used to send the Nazis to uh, the camps there. I mean, the Dutch to the, to the camps and the Jewish people. And it's a museum now, it still is. But we was in the old part, so it was the original part. So when I got there Christmas Eve, I've got there and there was another two people in there on, on my wing and there's another three on the other wing, that was it. There's six of us in total, and, and there's like 20, a minimum of 22 guards before they open the door, before any, anybody is allowed out of anywhere. And it, everything's triple doored. So you go through one door on your own, you're always on your own, you're never with the guards, unless it's four of them or two of them, depending how big they are. And you're never with another prisoner in the presence of a guard, you're just kept separately all the time. So you go in one door, that door locks, you move into that space, that door locks off and then the new door opens, so you can never go through a door. It's always a three-door system. And then you get into the thingy on that Christmas Eve, then it was a, a young lad who was only 19 at the time, Frankie Peters from Venlo, and he was in for a mass murder, he killed nine people. He killed a, a Dutch bloke who he assassinated by putting a bullet in every joint in his thingy and then one in his thingy. He was only 19 when I first met him. And then he killed nine Turkish people as well on top of it. But they never found any of that, just the one that he got found guilty for. And he got, he, he, technically, he only got th uh, three years for that because it was a drug related crime. It was, he got the 21 years for the other nine, but they never found any bodies or any evidence or nothing. Still fighting it today, but they've extended it to a natural life sentence. And he made me a pizza that night. <laughs> Yeah. So you're not just you know, hanging around with all the not just drug laws, but no, like well, no, psychopaths. The, he, he was the, the other. What's he like? Was he, was he only nineteen? He was only nine. He was a kid. 
And he don't take motors, nine motors. Well, he didn't. He always told me he didn't. Them other nine was made up by some fucking junkie. And it stuck all the way through. All his appeals failed, everything all the way through. And I've seen a programme about him on uh, in on the Dutch television about New Vosseveld. And it was called Frankie Peters, the Bender from Venlo. But Bender in Dutch means gang. I always told him what it meant over here, but yeah, yeah. I never really got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. when you come back then to, where did you go here, Whitemore? Went to Whitemore, yeah, landed. And you were in Tripoli again? Triple Cat A there, yeah. Who were you Triple Cat A with? Uh, there was three three of us in there, Kenny Noy, Mickey Steele from the Essex Boys, and uh, a Turkish bloke called uh, Kena. He was doing 40 years for heroin smuggling. That was the four of us. Some fucking four that, and it? Yeah, it was a bit of a crew, yeah. What was Kenny Noy like? Kenny, me, me and Kenny spent uh, practically, apart from, because what, what happened in there, it was, we were being treated like dogs at first. There was the same in Holland. We, we, uh, the, the king of the, the gypsies, he took the whole system to court and it ended up in the European Court of Human Rights for inhumane treatment to human beings because it was coming around every 30 minutes. He was slamming the hatch on you or shining a torch in your face. And that was every 30 minutes all the way through the night. They'd never leave you alone. And until you moved, they wouldn't lay, move the torch off you. And they tried repeating that. In, so that the, the Dutch Triple K got shut down. Corbus was there. And they moved us out all, all on the same day. And then I got moved to uh, like a double K prison, which was in the top of a big block of like flats. And it was secure as, as anything, unless you wanted to throw your toilet through the window and jump out. That was your only way out. And uh, when we got back to, to England, they was at it again the same. And it was Kenny now who took them to court again. And uh, we, like I said, I was there two and a half, nearly three years. But they used to come round all night, fucking banging the hatch and, you know, keeping you awake and shining the torch until you moved. They didn't really get any sleep. So, sort of got used to it, but it was very ad ad uh, uh, aggressive at the beginning. But even, even they sort of edged off a little bit towards the end. But Kenny got them shut down. They, they closed the triple cat A system in England because of Kenny and I. He paid a right few hundred grand to take it all the way to the European courts. The English courts said, no, you carry on, do what you want. But it was the European courts that got it shut down. They reopened it again now, but under big different conditions. But yeah, it, was a, it was a strange thing. But it, in, in a way, it was good in its own way because you was away from the main uh, the main wings and all the trouble. Yeah. You know, apart from them coming around shining torches in your face, but... We got that stopped pretty soon. It was only there about a year before that stopped. But it's still, like I say, we got it closed down because of inhumane treatment. How long were you together for? <clears throat> uh, me, me and Kenny spent nine years. Yeah, nearly nine years together on and off. I used to, I, I cooked for Kenny all, all the way through. and He used to chop the food up. I used to cook it. Because you can cook in them places. And then I, I'm on the day that they closed it down, they sent me to... Uh, Full Sutton, and they put Kenny on the wing, and then a couple of months later they moved him up to Full Sutton, and then was back again as a geo. He was cooking and thing, and we trained together for years. He's fat guy. Yeah, yeah, very, very fit. fit. Yeah, yeah. And he's Yeah, yeah. He's out. I've not met him since Kenny. We're not allowed to be make contact with ex-crim. Do you get put back inside if you do? I'm still on license. Yeah, I've still Life got license. Yeah. Well, that, that's a different thing. But I'm still on parole. I've still got a year of parole to go yet. So February, not this February coming, February next year, I'm a, I'm a proper free man then. I've also got probation. Back over to Columbia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think I'll uh, miss them places. Have <laughs> you not travelled a fuck over the last 10 years? No, no passport. Nothing? No, not allowed to. Do you need to sign in anywhere every week or every month? Uh, I have to, there's certain restrictions I have to stay on. I have to, they have to know where I sleep every night. So... Uh, can only have one car, one bank account, one phone, all that sort of stuff. Still probation every month. Still After ten years. But you're just happy to have your freedoms. That's the first time yeah. you've ever been. Well, next year's the first time you've probably been free yeah. since you were since like, 1991. Well, 87 really. 1987 it was. So it was Does that feel weird for you? It will, but I feel free now anyway. I don't, yeah. you know, 
I don't get pressure off uh, probation and all that. I'm not. But I attend. I suppose if you didn't attend, you'd be back inside. But mm -hmm. I don't fuck about with things like that when you've done 16 and a half. They've had enough off me. They're not getting any more. It's a long time, man, and you're, yeah. your life away, in it? The, yeah, uh, I missed everything in my life. My son's growing up, all of it. Death's in the family. You, you miss everything. It's not, not a nice thing. Yeah. All that time going by. But at the time, you don't think about it, do you? Just cracking on with what you're doing. Yeah. Like, That's see, the thing that we yeah. can sit here and tell the stories and people be going, fuck me. That's unbelievable. Like, people buy into this stuff so much, like yeah. true crime and people doing what they've done, but it's the the massacre of the fucking ripple effect uh, yeah. of the family, especially, everybody yeah. destroy yeah. around it to then. Yeah. When do you start thinking into that kind of stuff once you're caught? Mm. Because I'd imagine the conscience grows. When you start changing and making changes, the conscience grows and you start realising your bubble pops. Then you start realising the people that it's affected. Yeah. When did you start realising that method of thinking? A few, a few years into the sentence, you know, when you when you start to lose family members, you start realising that, fuck, you know, I, I've missed something here, bad, that never going to come back again. Uh, it, it, it's an hard part, but you don't, I didn't tend to think about it too much when I was on the run. I was too busy trying to not save my own skin in a, in a way, but there was no skin to save, it really was a, It was already devastated. It was never going to go away, the 22, and it was only going to get worse. So, yeah, early in the sentence, when you can sit down and sort of relax, because you're safe in prison, aren't you? If you're not safe in prison, you're booked, aren't you? But you, I felt, felt a bit safer once I was in prison after everything I'd been through. Being with Colombian cartels and fucking going through the jungles and thing is, uh, anything could happen to you. Flying planes across between Venezuela and Colombia, anything can happen to you. Uh, and you start reflecting on everything, you start thinking, fuck, you <coughs> that. Yeah. How, but that just shows you your character and how, like, you just went down a 30 stretch, you'd never snitched on anyone, you'd done your sentence heads fucking high that like mm. you've travelled the world meeting some of the most fucking ruthless people on this planet but I think that shows you the size of your balls do you know what I mean like there's not many people can do that like you can actually come out of prison and go do you know what I've done it with fucking uh, I'd imagine it would have been tough but you've done it with pride do you know what I mean there's, like we mm. spoke earlier so many snitches now did you ever get offered a deal no never Never. Never came to me with no, anything. Nothing. No. Just wanted you, didn't it? Yeah. Well, that's the problem, isn't it, when yeah. you're at the top? Yeah. You know, who, who are you going to put in? Okay, so he's fucking same level as me. <laughs> so, no. Yeah. Just put yourself more in, more than anything. <laughs> yeah, so. What do you think, looking back at that mad period of your life for 30 years, like, what do you, because it's, it's still a fucking buzz at the end of the day. It's still something triggered in your mind where you think, well, the part of you miss it. There's part of you feel dead that you don't, you're not doing that yeah. mad stuff anymore. No, the, it, it did while you was doing it a little bit, but no, 16, 16 and a half years in prison takes all that fucking fanciness away from it. Yeah. You know, it brings you right back down to earth and, and you, all that you can do is literally regret what you've fucking done when you sat there day after day after day in the jail. There's fucking no glamour in that, mate. All, all that thing that passed before it, it's just disappeared, it's dissolved and there isn't, Sometimes you get excited when you're out in the middle of the ocean on a big fucking yacht and things like that. Or you're flying the planes, like I say, across them tropical islands and things like that, or across the fucking pyramids. You know, that's that's the buzz side of it, but it don't last long. You're soon back on the ground again and dealing with people who, who put a bullet in your head at the, any sign of any fucking weakness and things like that. No, I, did, I didn't see it as glamour, really. It was a lot of... I don't know how to say it. It was, it's just hard to explain. People, if you've not been in that situation, it's hard to explain that you can stay calm and you don't get excited about it because you know how fucking dangerous it is. Yeah. It was always, because it's a different level. It's not dealing with a few ounces or a couple of kilo here and there. It's dealing with people who just kill you and kill all your family if they find out that you've done them wrong. So it becomes very serious. That's why I never smoked or drank or anything while I was doing that. In case you made an arse of yourself. Well, I guess you made a fucking mistake. You forgot something, mm -hmm. you know. There's, there's been a few times when people, uh, you know, it got that bad with that we were drug testing people, you know, because of the seriousness of what was happening. 
And then when we didn't, the people we sent to places and they fell asleep or they got pissed or they couldn't do something and then the boat's been and gone and fucking left the stuff behind. You know, we had to recover from that. So, no, it was very serious and very, very... Uh, we have to be straight with, with them, even though we're doing a crooked game. You have to be really straight with everybody. And your answers have to be spot on as well. Mm -hmm. No mm. lies, no bullshit. No lies, no fucking Anybody ever about. get like, like lie detectors or anything? With big shit. No, we, we never got, the only, like I say, the only trouble we ever got into with anybody, because we were quite efficient at what we did. Uh, and the only thing was when I had to go and explain what had happened to theirs. And then there was never any other occasions. Some there, there was where we lost a few, well, I'll say a few, 10,000 kilo of ash. That went missing at one point, but it got caught. And the people found that it got caught and nothing happened about it. Everybody was happy. So we never lost anything that wasn't caught by the police, sort of thing, luckily. Yeah, it was all above board. You could yeah. cover for it. Yeah. How did you end up doing your sentence, 22 years? How, did you just get the head down and stay focused? Uh, trying appeals. I know you couldn't no, yeah, but you no, we, I tried to appeal for 14 years, but it never got anywhere. Uh, no, I, ne I never settled to it. There's two, on two occasions, uh, my QCs, different QCs, uh, asked me, you know, where, where do you want to get released from? It was that close to me walking on it on, on two occasions, but in the end, the judge just said, no, what the police did was illegal, but there you go. These people are, are thems that we can say, uh, well, the end justifies the means. And they used it a couple of times on us. Because I think, because we were so prolific, I suppose. Yeah, yeah they're always going to get you, no matter what. Right? Yeah. They, they've had something yeah. stick, like all the stuff you did get away from. Yeah. It's, it tends to see that everybody they interview, it's not actually, when they get their sentence, it's not actually what they've done. It's all the shit that happened. The intelligence it, yeah. is there that they know they've done. It's kind of, yeah. somebody told me that the, the, the judges have, I think it was Andrew Pritchard actually. They, when he got his sentence, the judges got showed what he got away with before. Mm. I don't know, it was peace. I was like, that's a paper. So they add the sentences for the shit they've got away with yeah. onto his sentence. I believe that. Yeah. And and also, I don't, I don't think it's stuff that they've actually got away with. I think it's just what people say to him as well. You know, coppers who don't like you or somebody this. Well, he got away with that. We know he was involved in that. We never got charged, but we know he was involved in it. I think they're given that sort of information, mm -hmm. especially at certain levels. I don't think they did it for petty type things, but I think when they reach the levels we sort of reach, they'll, they'll get information from all over the place. Yeah, major intelligence. Yeah, to make sure that we don't get out on the street. So even you got into, the, got into the wing for the first time, <coughs> what was that like to get put into normal population? Uh, well, that was a few years later. I didn't get put into normal uh, thingy for nearly eight years. How did that feel? Uh, it was strange coming out of that. Because uh, you, you're in your own little bubble there. Mm -hmm. Like I say, there's there's only uh, the four of us at the most and 22 guards. So, you know, you're in a bubble. You get education and you get your own gym on there, but you never come off there. And if you do come off there, I can always like moving the queen. You know, the helicopter, like I say, helicopter, I got. I had to go to hospital twice as a, as a rush thing. And that turned into just the fucking craziest thing you've ever seen, helicopters and things. Police officers running up the, the aisles in the, in the hospital with machine guns, going up to corners and putting the guns around the corners at York Hospital. They was fucking ill with me there. So I had two blood clots. Where? And, at York Hospital from Paul Sutton. Mm -hmm. And you had to be had to be rushed under triple cat A, well double cat A actually that, and the helicopter has to float above the, the the hospital all day long. They had to change it three times, and then you've got all the coppers downstairs. It was fucking crazy. Hundreds. I think it must have cost maybe a million, maybe even more for for one hospital visit. Because when I went, everything fucking stopped. Oh, so, crazy times. When did you when did you start doing well, your artwork? Uh, from from day one, really. Like I say, when when I first got arrested in ninety one, uh, a couple of days after I'd been in the police house, I'd asked for a, a pen and paper to start drawing. So it started more or less from the beginning. Was that your escape for yeah. what yeah. you'd done and what you've been doing? Yeah. To then? Draw therapy. 
set up a definitely a drawing will take you away from from the misery around you because you're not looking at the walls anymore you're looking at the painting you or the drawing you're creating there's also different ways of people use writing and write stories and books or songs or whatever but you need something to take you out of there because the the misery of looking at 30 year sentence and you're gonna have to do at the time it was going look i was looking at that i needed to do 20 years because it was two thirds at the time and it changed uh, about halfway through it to the halfway system got a little note under my door telling me i just got back three years of time because it changed the systems but yeah art took over really took over everything in there just you could study and paint in the in the end i was the only person in full sort of who had a set of proper oil paints in there because it didn't allow it after that so everybody was begging me for paints and things like that I ended up giving some to certain people but i had to keep it all myself yeah so you've been out 10 years see when you got out was it 2009 2011 uh 12 2012 so see when you got out what are you thinking are you thinking i'm going to get to fuck obviously you couldn't but Obviously, everything you've ever done, ever, anything the police have had something on you, you've done the toes. Yeah. So what was your mindset? Look, I'm getting a bit older now. It's, I'm just going to accept to stay here and. Oh, well, I I, I was lucky because because I did what I did in prison. Uh, I painted a lot. Uh, I think I walked out of uh, Loudon Grange with twenty odd paintings in a trolley. It must have looked fucking crazy coming out of there, like Pickford's coming out of there, and uh, so I instantly had money. I had money to from the paintings. I sell the paintings, and I sold quite a few. I sold. Uh, I won the Costler Awards when I was in prison in 2011. I won the platinum and the the bronze prize in the same year. And that painting was sold to the managing director of Timpsons. He bought that painting, so I had a, a. I think I got 500 quid or something for it. So as soon as I got out, I had 500 quid. Where normally you'd have your your, your allowance. That was it. And then I sold paintings and carried on. So I was never put back in that position of desperation because I had somewhat different to do. Mm -hmm. A purpose? A purpose, yeah. And somewhat where I could make money from straight away. So, you know, I wasn't on the street begging or pestering your your family. I could support myself more or less as I walked out. I had paintings that I'd sent out. I think I had about 50 paintings at at my sister's house or my my brother's house. I sent them out from the prison. So if you can learn a trade or something like that, it takes that pressure away, you know, of having no money and thinking that because of who you was, that you've got the right to have money or something like that, whatever ego things people have. And none of that came into my mind. Yeah. And plus I had my family around me. And then again, like what you said there, just too old, man. Can't be going into prison at my age. It's a death sentence, isn't it? Mm-hmm. There's got to be a time when everybody stops. And I think that, that was enough for me. I remember the... People, I always used to think about police pestering me and mivering me and all that. And uh, when when I came out, they put me in an hostel for six weeks, so I wasn't allowed home. And uh, the I think it was the second day in the hostel. I got my only visit that I've had from the police, and it was two coppers, and they they come in and said, "Oh yeah, nice to meet you," and all that. Shook my hands and everything, and they said, "I don't think we have to bother about you, do I?" And he went. I went, what, what do you mean? He said, well, you're getting, a bit on, you're getting on a bit now, aren't you? And that was it then. I thought, you're fucking right, you know. <laughs> getting on a bit to be going in and out of these yeah. jails. First time you agree with the coppers. Yeah, yeah. But it's a young man's game, isn't it, going in and out of jail? I couldn't do that anymore. Yeah, but the life you've led, you've been the cream of the crop, you've been top tier where you've worked with the biggest and the best at their, in, their, in their trade. But how do you... <clears throat> When you when you're doing that and becoming the biggest, like I've interviewed so many different people at so many different levels, like you are the number one at, at your craft, especially from the UK. But every single person, no matter what they were shifting, it's all ended in fucking disaster. There's never any happy ending to a certain degree. Where <clears throat> do you feel that as well? Because that you are so high and doing what you're doing, flying flying private planes, making millions, mm. doing the biggest deals about like. The, and then you come crashing down, do your sentence, try and get through your sentence alive, and then right. come out and doing your painting. Like, do you ever feel like, okay, you're a free man now, you're doing your paintings, as part of you feel that 
everything's all right? Or do you still battle to then think you still miss that old life? No, I don't, I don't miss that old life any, at all anymore. I don't think I ever did. I, I never enjoyed it while I was doing it anyway, so to go back to it is it, thinking. This new life of painting is fucking fantastic. You get to see all sorts. I mean, like the show we had the other day. Congratulations, by the way. thanks. The, the amount of people that was there and shown an interest was phenomenal. And now we're, I'm mixing with a rapper called Suspect, you know, who's an up-and-coming top rapper. He's going to be all the way to the top. It's fucking unbelievable, considering where I was a few years before that. And uh, I don't know, you just get accepted. If, if you carry on and, and plod on doing what you're doing, society sort of comes in and accepts it. Not all society, but they come in and accept you for what you're doing. If you can see you spent 10 years painting pictures and not committing crime, then people, well, I think everybody enjoyed the show anyway. It yeah, was a big clear. show. We will leave the links in the description to your social media and stuff as well for people to get yeah. in contact in case they want to buy any paintings. Yeah. But for you to... Your caliber, me <clears throat> speaking to you now, like, it shows that you you could adapt to any any situation. Anyway, you've clearly got the fucking the minerals to be sitting and, and talking to the biggest criminals. So for you to adapt and to sell paintings and create an audience and create something, you, is it the same mentality to, to be shifting gear to then be shifting paintings? Yeah. Is a it's just the same, same thing. Same, it's a product again, isn't it? Yeah, I'm just dealing with a product. You know, the, the, I think there's there's loads of people like me who, who are criminals. Who, who should have been CEOs of big companies, you know, because we've got the ability to mix and, and, and uh, talk to people from all over the world. You know, at one point I was speaking with Colombians, fucking Turkish, Moroccans, everybody on the planet, really, you know, we're dealing with them. So we're in, in our own little way, we're international business people. And if we could find a way to convert that from, instead of dealing with cocaine, instead of dealing with goods or... Whatever it is that you you can get yourself into, and at the moment mine's at mine's art and everything that's associated with it. So it's just switched from cocaine to art. That's all we're doing. Yeah. yeah. What makes a good businessman? Uh, diplomacy, I think, more than anything that you can, especially in this day and age now that you can speak to Chinese people and you speak to Russians and you speak to whoever it is. I mean, I've spoke to Russian mafia. When, when we was dealing with it, you know, on the on the fall of of uh, Yugoslavia and all them countries, that's when we was sort of dealing. And, you know, I know I've dealt with them and I've dealt with royal family people, I've dealt with all sorts of people. I've dealt with Colombians, uh, you know, I don't know. We're just diplomats, I suppose. Who's been easiest to work with? Uh, the Colombians. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. They, 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 even though it looks crazy and mad, they, they build everything around the family. So once you, you they, they accept you're into there, you know, I, I was at their family houses. I wasn't in some mad apartment somewhere. They take you to the to the ranches where the ball rings are and the, the stables and the fucking tigers and the, the chimpanzees. They take you to their homes, you know. Yeah, there was a, they're very friendly, the South Americans. Not like any of us. Turkish are different because they're very strict and they stick to quite a different way of life compared to the Colombians, really. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, the South Americans. Yeah. If I could go somewhere, that's where I'll end my days in South America. They're just so laid back, even though they're crazy Colombian yeah. ones. So, see that when uh, Escobar, El Chapo's and stuff, because they all get caught. All the heads end up, all the big yeah. heads end up getting cut down yeah. that. Is there anybody ever make it out? No. Uh, well, there must be somebody somewhere. But it's it, it's if you think about it, if we would have sat down and thought from the beginning, what's the point of this? Because the only thing we can do is start. There's two of us dealing a few drugs. Then there's four of you. Then six of you. Then there's eight of you. Before you know it, there's hundreds. There's hundreds of Colombians involved in. There's hundreds of thingy. So it, it's an inevitable consequence. The bigger you get, the more chance you're going to get of being caught because there's more people involved in it. The more people involved in it, the more right. chance of, of, of grassing and the police knowing about it. So it's a, for, for me, it's an inevitable consequence. The bigger you get, the easier it is you, that you're going to get caught yeah. because of just the sheer amount of people involved in it. Yeah, yeah. So the, but the levels that you just went through, again, it's more risk, as you say, like more people, more risk. Yeah. And that's where the self-doubt, the paranoia would creep in and everybody's a fucking who do you trust but you clearly about what a network that you did trust you clearly done your sentence with 
So yeah. dignity that. So see when you're going forward, so what do you think then looking back at it all, Stephen? But telling your story now, does it, does it bring back a lot of memories you think, fuck me, like I lived a proper life? No, I look, I look back at them with, with regret more than anything, that side of it. You know, because I, I, know, I know that if if I would have been born into a, a richer family or this or, you know, gone to university and done all that, because that's what I'd recommend to anybody. Fuck all the crime, just go to university, that's where the money is. Uh, if we... I. I in this day and age, I wouldn't even put myself as a criminal. There's hundreds of politicians who are far more criminals than me. That's a ever been. Yeah, that's it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we know what each yeah. other means. Yeah. But, uh, no, I don't even see myself as a criminal anymore. You know, I'm not. There was something we were saying the other, the other night. When I, when I was in Holland, this is how mad the world is at the moment. When I was in Holland, I got the, I was doing 30 years. They give me 22 years. And it, it came up in in the court with the judge because it's a different system there. You can talk to the judge. So I can just stand up and speak straight to the judge because it's just the judge, there's no jury there. And there's three judges and you speak to the judge. And uh, we were talking about why he was saying that he had to give it me consecutive to the 22 years. And that put me in a position where at that moment in time, I received the biggest sentence ever given out in Dutch history including fucking pre thingies where they had all the slaves and everything. It was the biggest sentence that they ever gave out because it was consecutive to the 22 that I already had. So he put it up to 30 years. And he said, there's nothing I can do about it. What do we do? You know, you've escaped from prison. You've gone and committed a more serious crime. So we can't not give you the sentence and make it consecutive. We've got to concurrent. We've got to make it consecutive. Otherwise, there's no punishment for people who escape. So you're going to take the brunt of that and you're going to get the 30 years. But he said, I don't want to do it to you. But I've got no choice. And then he fucking hell, he, he was more upset than me. So He was like, it was for you, but he still had to yeah, talk with he had sense. To, he had to do it, yeah. 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 So where do you go now with the paint, Stephen? What's <coughs> your plans? Obviously, you've got the entrepreneurial ships to be. Yeah. Top boy. Like, do you see yourself, do you see this going global as well? Uh, hopefully, yeah. I've got an invitation at the moment to go to different places. Uh, I've joined up with a company called Nine Protocol, who, who are my promotion team, and we're working really well together. Uh, we're planning things in the future. We've got a few collaborations with uh, uh, big artists that we're going to do paintings of and installation-type things all over London, so you'll be seeing quite a lot things popping up all over the place. It's, it's really exciting for what we're planning and, and, and hopefully that where, we're, where we're going. And we're now involved in this uh, new technology called NFTs, which are non-pungible tokens. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about them. No, but I'm, I'm yeah. ticked. What's that? Well, it, it, there's, there's an old crypto world mm. out there. Uh, I was lucky enough to get involved in it when it first started. Uh, started doing a bit of mining for the coins in the first place where we had these computers, which I learned a lot about in, in prison. I started learning programs like uh, Photoshop and Illustrator when I was in prison. So I had the, quite a bit of technical knowledge as well as the art stuff that I did. I did the computer side of things as well and, and the music side. And uh, you, you can collect these coins, but now since Christmas of this year, somebody's come up with uh, a new thing called the NFTs where it's linked on what's called the blockchain. So the, the blockchain is what all you, you buy your coins on and you need certain wallets and things to, to join in and you can buy coins off there. And then this, this new NFT thing came out and it's really based on for, for artists. So what an NFT is, it's a non-fungible token that you can, if you've got a piece of art where you can put it and log it onto what's called the blockchain and it registers it there and then on the blockchain. So you get a big, massive number that can't be messed about with. Nobody can interfere with it. It can't be changed. So whatever you put on is set there now for the rest of eternity if the blockchain exists. But you can also sell your stuff on the blockchain itself. And these are what are called the NFTs, which is going through the world like uh, a dose of salt. Damien Hurst has just done a big one. And I think in 15 minutes, it's up $25 million. So they sell really quickly, but they sell big. And uh, we've just done our own 
show where we built a prison cell out of hemp blocks, which is a link within the the, the crime, but it's not a, an illegal product of the hemp, which is a cannabis side of the plant, but they make, they make bricks for it now for building houses or flats where it's a highly insulating brick. So we've built a full-size cell in the, in the barge house in London with, with a, a bedding and everything so people can go in. But that then becomes an NFT. So then we can put an image on it. The, the, the image that I painted on the, the second day that I was in prison from the beginning in 1991, which was a Mongolian uh, warrior with an eagle on, but it's all in black and white, just a pencil thing, because that's all I was allowed. And we uh, plastered that over the, the whole of the cell. So it had a picture of it. And then that gets cut down into NFTs. And then we've done a 4G, uh, 4D digital image of the cell itself, which then explodes into it. And then we've incorporated it with this rapper called Suspect, who does a song which he wrote for the NFT and for, for, for my show. And the whole thing then becomes an NFT, which is a big package which we'll put up to the public in about it takes us about a month to finish it all off all the technical side of it because it's all digital based and you actually buy this nft that and you get a digital copy on your phone like well, that's shares. all you do get like shares people like, buying shares into it in a way yeah we we, yeah. we become uh, i try to explain it to people about you know how, how what what is it and really it's the, the artist becomes a token he becomes the coin so like this, the suspect, he's one coin, I'll become another coin, even though we're not coins, we're just... So if you blow up, the shares go up? The shares go up, yeah, it's exactly the same thing. Yeah, yeah People then invest in, into you oh. through these NFTs that they can buy at whatever price that they're, they're able to buy them at. Mm -hmm. and, but because we're only doing a limited edition, it'll still be quite expensive by the time they, they come to buy it. But then we'll do other things that come off from that, all different types of NFTs, even just stickers and things like that. Sounds and then copies and prints. And How things. do I get a podcast on it, host on it? I'm just about to blow up. Yeah. I'm going to take things to new heights, man. Like, I'm just about to level up. I feel as if I've leveled up, but I'm just about to go even higher. Yeah. So I'm just to take. Well, you, you can turn yourself into an NFT. We'll talk about that. Yeah, let's do it. Separately. Man. Yeah, 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 definitely. Because it, it's fantastic the reach you get. You, you, you're not, no longer, you're just an artist in your, in your room. You're an artist who could reach nearly. 100 million people on the planet because it goes all over the world instantly free of charge as well mm. so the, there's not all these big fees that you have to pay because joining the blockchain it, it's it's out there it's open source it was given to the world so anybody can join it and and use it yeah and it's going to uh, eventually it'll eradicate the banking system because people will be on that and yeah well that's stop man it'll stop now yeah the money currency that will be finished by the next three to five years. Yeah, they're already doing cash. it in China. Yeah, no, oh, they're taking away in China where people are getting. Well, my, my son, one of my sons is uh, well, both of my sons are deeply involved in China. One speaks fluent uh, Chinese and writes it as well. And uh, when he was in China, it started off a few years ago where it, everything was on the phone. So he just walked out of the house. He didn't need money. Didn't need his bank account. Didn't need anything. As long as it was on the on the phone on a uh, an app called WeChat. You could walk on a bus and the, the money would be taken out. You could walk in a shop, pick some up, and the money's taken off you. And towards the end, they didn't even need the phone. Once he got the 5G, they didn't even need the phone. It just came off facial recognition. So you could walk in a shop with no phone, no nothing. Walk out with the goods. They'll be charged to you because of your face. And that's coming here pretty soon. Just as well you never got his facial reconstruction. Ah, we're, we're, we're fucked. <laughs> he couldn't do anything. It's unbelievable that the technology, but it's it blown my mind how you know about that. But clearly, you're an intelligent man. I know people probably say no, but you've still done 20 odd years in prison. Yeah, but I wasn't that clever, was yeah, it? Yeah, but you were still top of the tree. And to get yeah. to that level and still be here talking about it shows you the calibre of guy you are, shows you yeah. the trust that you had all around the world. And the things that you're doing now, like your art stuff, like the stuff that you've just mentioned there, like it's yeah. mind blowing that what you could have put your mind to and be yes, I think cream I, of the crop. I, I think a lot well of us. That? You've stayed out. Do you feel proud that you're making these changes? Because even when, I, when you're speaking about your art earlier, you can see how happy yeah. you were. Yeah. But obviously, listen, crime doesn't pay. It fucking doesn't. But, no, it doesn't. Um, but to be doing what you're doing now, to be staying out, and there must have been a lot of temptation there to start, but to, to be staying clean and and sticking to something that you believe in and yeah. 
taking you out to yeah, next level do you I think feel proud yeah I feel proud but I think also I think you need a purpose yeah when you come out of prison and, and you just you've been in prison and just cracking on with what just the same then you, you you're fucked when you come out mm -hmm. you need a purpose inside the prison and that needs to be given well, uh, the opportunity because I could, when I was in Full Sutton and Long Light and all, all of them, not Long Light, and uh, Whitemore, in a, a capacity of 5,000 people, there's 100 people in education. So, so much wrong there, isn't it? You know, they're not, <clears throat> they're not housing people to be uh, educated, they're housing people to come back in again. And if they wanted to change it, you just change the education system in there and educate people. Yeah. I'd even force young offenders, me, to. Uh, to that they can't come out until they've done certain things you've got a gcse even you go and get a gcse and we'll give you a, a week off or something like that go and get a fucking a level we'll give you a month off force them to do it because they won't do it by themselves just busy smoking what is it now that yeah, fucking spice, shite, spice fucking and what have you skunk. yeah but 75 percent or eight percent of people um end up back in prison anyway yeah so it's the, the percentage the rate's high but then it becomes a money making scheme because it's 40, 50, 40 or 50 grand per inmate per year. Yeah. So it's a lot of money to be made for prisoners. Yeah. Which is slavery as well because they're doing jobs that they're getting paid fuck all for. Yeah. But people just. Them, them menial jobs that they give in prison, you know, I would never have done them there in there. You know, I, di I didn't go to work, I went to education. So you don't, you get hardly any money when you go to education. But that was a way forward for me. But you've educated yourself. Yeah. For anybody that's watching that's maybe thinking that life of crime's a place to be, Stephen, what advice would you give for them? Uh, well, yeah, it's a great place to be if you want to be miserable, lonely, cast away from your family, and uh, the potential of either being shot dead or abused all the way through your fucking criminal career, so good luck with that. Just go to school and get your education and, and earn money that you can go and spend because if you think about criminal money, it's not even, it's not worth the amount of money that a normal pound is worth. It's worth about 20p. By the time you've had to disguise it and hide it and cover it, it's just not there. And the amount of people that do make it to the top, the, the, the consequences of any slight failure is massive amounts of fucking jail. You know, 16 and a half years for me is a maximum. I think that a man can survive before that institutional thing starts to kick in. And then 20-odd years, 30 years, I think you're institutionalised anyway by that time. So the smaller sentences, but forced education. What about turning your life? Anybody ever approached you turning your life into a film? Yeah, we, we've uh, got a few things at the moment. It's unbelievable. A book story. first. Yeah, book first and then yeah. film, yeah. Is that on the pipeline? Uh, yeah, we started the book. Because that's an art and a craft as well, to put something yeah, on Yeah, need the... Uh, Need help. I've got help for all that sort of stuff. Yeah. There's people, you know, I've got good people behind me who are looking after my interests and as well, so not to be. Because you see these films, look. Like, what do you see? You see when you watch the films, look, like, have you ever seen Blow? Film Johnny Depp? Yeah. See if you see these films, does it remind you of yourself? Yeah, the, the, the one with, uh, <coughs> I always forget the name of it. Uh, born, born in the USA, is it? With, with uh, where he's flying backwards and forwards with the CIA and all that. To America. Oh. Uh, was that not was that not Blow? Was it Blow? Johnny Depp, they were flying. No, it wasn't Johnny. It was uh what's he called? What? Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise, Tom that was Cruise. it. Oh yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that one. He couldn't fucking take off the, the runway. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. They had to move the runway. So I've been longer. in that position, mate. I've yeah. had stuff in the planes mm -hmm. flying from Colombia into Venezuela with it and we've landed in the fucking bottoms of the trees on the runway on the gate <laughs> at the bottom that's how close yeah. it was i watched that for not so long yes yeah, that, yeah. that, that one did yeah uh -huh. yeah because obviously some i had somebody on i had a, a sniper on and obviously when he says he watches army films he's like that's all bullshit it's nothing like that but yeah. some of these films are some of them are like it yeah yeah i hope I, uh, if we get to it my mine will be like it because uh yeah, there's a few times when it was a bit airy, them fucking plane drop rides, mm -hmm. flying and what have you. But the future's looking bright for you? Yeah, looking forward to, to the art and, and taking it. Well, we're hoping to take it around the country, but also to other countries once I get my passport back. Much uh, like I say, it's only a year. It's not far off now. Yeah, you'll, yeah. you'll fucking smack it out of the park, yeah. man. It's game time. This is you putting everything in place for then when you're up. You are completely free yeah how do you think you feel sitting on a plane though 
Do you think you'll be there just walking through customs and shit? Yeah, that, that'll be a strange yeah. day going through the customs. You're going to get stalked at every fucking get, are you, every are, customs, yeah. don't you? I use it as a joke and, and say to people, oh, you can come with me the first time yeah. and all that. Fuck off, I'm not coming That's with you. That's their passport stamp for good, man. Yeah. Anywhere they travel, they're going to get fucking searched. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to travel on my own for the first time. <laughs> I don't think anybody Everybody will be want 10 to feet fucking behind. travel with you anyway. Yeah. But, but, it, yeah. but it will be strange. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it'll yeah. bring back a lot of emotion bring, for you. It will do. I might fucking break down and cry. <laughs> Cuss them and say, look at what you've done yeah. to me. But you're a free man now, Stephen. You've done yeah. over 10 years now in books, films, paintings, yeah. all the stuff that you're doing in the background. Listen, for coming on today and telling your story, listen, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think nice. you're a good Thank man. You. I think you're 100%. Yeah. Um, I believe everything that you say you're going to do. You're clearly very intelligent. But for coming on today, brother, and telling your story, I appreciate it. Would you like to finish up on anything, Stephen? Just uh, the two worlds, in the criminal world and the normal world. Stick with the normal world and fucking educate yourself because that's all that the other world does is educate yourself. They educate themselves away from us. We need to educate ourselves towards them and that way we'll uh, not be going into these fucking places for 16 and a half years and rotting in jail. Education, that's all I can say. Yeah. Health and education. Mm -hmm. Just keep it going. We will leave all the links for your Instagram and stuff for your paintings in the description box. Shout out to Harry as well for setting up the interview. Thank you, brother. Yeah. And um, listen, Stephen, God bless for the nice future. To and I look forward to see what you do. Yeah, we'll end it. See you next. Definitely, brother. Yeah. Thank you. See you later. Um,